2017 meeting of the Town Council of the Town of Corte Madera. Could we please have the roll call? Councilmember Andrews. Present. Councilmember Bailey. Here. Councilmember Ravazio. Here. Vice Mayor Condon. Here. Mayor First. Here. Would you all please join me to, for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. First up tonight is open time for public comment. This is the time we have set aside for folks from the community to speak on anything not on tonight's agenda. Is there anybody who would like to speak at open time? Seeing none, we will move on to presentations. Our town manager uh, would like to introduce some new staff. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Um, I'm really excited to uh, introduce uh, some staff members, new staff members tonight. Um, and really, I, I'm really excited uh, where we're headed. You know, as we celebrate the retirements of Dave and George over uh, multiple years of being with the town and, and how we've really heavily relied on them um, and how we transition moving forward to what our town uh, is going to look like. Um, and we rely heavily on, on planning, finance, and public works with the town manager, those four positions really go hand in hand in how we look, uh, problem solve, how we, how we look at the future and, and provide recommendations to the council to set the council up for success in your decision making. And when we step back, uh, our Daria, our finance director, Adam, our planning director, and myself really spent a lot of time to kind of what does that model look like moving forward? Not a model just in skill set, but personality, temperament, and what are we trying to accomplish uh, moving forward? And, and we built, with the help of HR, we built the public works director position, and we went back to um, kind of a, a traditional type of public works position, but we added a lot of expertise, uh, planning, economic development, administration, supervision, personnel. Each of our department heads moving forward, um, and, and I, I point this out because it's really important, uh, not like we were siloed before, but you will not see silos amongst departments. Our department heads have expertise across multiple fields and departments within the town. And so if you ever get tired of the town manager, I hope you don't. My idea is you'll have three or four possibilities of, of succession planning and possibilities for this town. And, and I'm really excited of our staff and where we're headed. And I wanted to um, add to that team tonight and introduce Peter Brown to you um, and give you a brief bio of Peter. Um, and so Peter was born uh, in our area. He was born in, uh, at Marin General Hospital and he grew up in Sonoma County. He has a political science degree uh, from Chico State University and studied civil engineering and city planning at UCLA, receiving his master's degree in urban planning in 2001. He has taught planning, statistics, and economic courses at UCLA, Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo, and the University of San Francisco. Peter brings us 17 years of experience in housing development, project management, personnel supervision, but also has specialized his career in transportation planning, traffic engineering, and climate ad adaptation techniques related to flood control and sea level rise. A lot of that work was in the city of San Francisco. Most recently, Peter was the manager of capital projects and financing at AC Transit in Oakland. And prior to that, he spent four years in Santa Barbara's Public Works Department and three years in the Sustainable Streets Division at San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency. Um, I could go on and on about Peter, but uh, I'll tell you that uh, during the interview process, Adam and I uh, interviewed candidates. Peter was, was clearly at the top of the list, and we're so lucky to have him. And I'm, I'm happy to introduce Peter Brown in, uh, to you now and ask him to say a couple, make a couple comments. So Peter, can you come on up? Madam Mayor, members of the council, Peter Brown, Public Works Director, I'm excited to be here. And thank you for that lovely introduction, uh, Todd. Uh, I think that um, you know, I couldn't agree with Todd more in the sense that this is an exciting time for the town of Corte Madera. Uh, I think that we are in the process of some change. I think that secession planning is happening. It's actual. It's real here. Uh, I wanted to just give you a few, uh, a few things that I'm looking forward to in terms of my work here as the public works director. 
I met with Mr. Dave Bracken today for about 90 minutes, and um, I think part of the reason why uh, Todd wanted to hire me in the time that he did was so that there's some overlap. I know Dave's uh, 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 retirement is pending, but my job while well, the time that we're overlapped is to download as much information as possible from him, and I really appreciated his time and expertise, and I know uh, I definitely have some big shoes to fill uh, in terms of the contribution that he's made to the community. Uh, I've already done a few tours of the town in terms of its infrastructure, uh, streets and roads. I know there's a lot of transportation projects. Uh, most of last Friday afternoon, I was looking at our flood control system, our 13 pump stations, really getting a feel for how those operate and, uh, and what we need to do to maintain those. <clears throat> One of the things that I've done in uh, both uh, Santa Barbara and San Francisco was, was uh, led the capital improvement program, and so that's something I know that we, we need to do here. Uh, I want to look at move into a five-year CIP, which is industry standard, uh, with the first couple years being fiscally constrained. We know where the resources are, where they're coming from, and what our top priority projects are. But in those last three years, we'll also have an idea of what's coming down the road. I think it'll help us do some comprehensive planning. Uh, I understand that flood control and sea level rise are big issues in Corte Madera. I know we've come a long way, and we may have more to go. Uh, and so I'm glad to bring <coughs> um, some ideas to the town for how we address that. Uh, I also know that uh, part of the work that Todd's done with his existing department heads is kind of look at reor reorganizing the, the, the departments. And one of those that has been primarily under change is public works. So now we have our maintenance and field operations division. Uh, as well as our engineering division, and both of those are coming together under a single public works director, whereas I believe in the past there may have been two um, different groups. Uh, I think another thing that Todd and I have in common is a vision for really relating to the community. Um, the members of uh, the town that, that live here and that visit here and work here, I think a good way to do that is to have more community meetings, um, really lend our ear to what the community priorities are, and that includes council as well as the citizenry. So I think Todd has done that before over the past year, and I look forward to joining him in some of those, you know, have coffee with the public works director, share your thoughts and ideas. Um, the last thing I'll mention um, is that I, I think uh, the energy here is, is good. You know, the people here are talented. Uh, you should be very proud of the staff that you have because I've been impressed with them in the short time. Um, that I've been here, and I also have the pleasure of introducing a, a new staff member. Uh, so I'll go ahead and, and get to that. Uh, I believe um, Nisha last name, Patel uh, had a pretty strong history here, and she's recently moved on, and her replacement is on board. So uh, Stuart Hare is our new senior civil engineer. Uh, he came on board in November. Uh, he's a graduate of UC Irvine with a degree in civil engineering. <coughs> He has nine years of private sector experience in transportation engineering, working in both Northern and Southern California, as well as Hawaii, Seattle, and Phoenix. He's got a breadth of experience. His public sector uh, work includes the city of Larkspur, where he was uh, in the engineering group for four years. And most recently, he spent the last 14 years with the town of Windsor as their deputy director of engineering, overseeing their transportation and development engineering services group. Stewart's lived in Marin for the past 20 years, and he's excited to be working now with the town of Corte Madera. And Stuart, I'll invite you up if you have a few words for the council. Good evening, Madam Mayor, uh, council members. First of all, I'd really like to thank Todd. Um, I feel very fortunate that Todd, and also Kelly Crow, um, that they selected me for this position. Um, as Peter mentioned, uh, Marin County is home for me. Um, I've worked for Windsor for about 14 years, and I think I've driven about 350,000 miles over that period of time. <laughs> so I really appreciate this short commute. Um, I'll echo Peter's uh, comments. You know, I really want to do right by uh, the Corte Madera residents. Um, I missed my time when I worked for the city of Larkspur, and I feel very fortunate that I, I get to come full circle and work for Corte Madera. Thank you very much. Thank you, and welcome, both of you. To, we're so glad to have you both. Yeah. All right. Um, before we move on to consent calendar, we um, have an urgency item that has been proposed. Um, if I might open it up to um, a brief description from Sloan. Is that sure. the yeah, and, correct and process? Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. I appreciate that. This is a... Oh, am I on? Yeah. So this is something that came to my attention after the agenda had already been published. Um, and it's a uh, letter which um, I'd like to 
described to the uh, council. Um, uh, and I think that the appropriate way, given the time constraints, um, is to seek a motion that it be added to the agenda as an emergency item. Um, I think in fairness to all those who were timely here, uh, it makes sense to put it at the end of the agenda. But um, uh, if there's any questions or inquiry from the public about the timeliness of it, it has to do with an order that will go into effect at the end of the year if we don't do something about it and try to send an advocacy letter now. So I'd like to tell you what the advocacy is about, et cetera, et cetera. So can we add it to the agenda later in t t tonight's meeting? Right. Let, let's touch on the subject so that the people in the audience. Um, so it's it's a. I represent the town of Marine Clean Energy. Um, Marine Clean Energy is our local uh, energy authority, which uh, purchases power, renewably sourced power, and distributes it to our communities. There is a new rule being um, considered uh, and I think tentatively accepted by the California Public Utilities Commission um, that would constrain um, what are called community choice aggregators, um, which is what marine clean energy is, and would impose limits on them without providing an opportunity for notice and input from the community. So the purpose of the letter is to ask that they provide that opportunity, basically. Thank you. So we're advocating for more open government if we approve this letter. That is correct. Thank you. So, um, do I hear a motion? Yes, I'd to like to move that we add it to the, to the agenda. Yes, I'll second it. Thank yeah. you. Is there Thank you, Bob. If I may, Any? Madam Mayor, I just want to clarify that the motion you're making is to, um, as because of a situation, to take immediate action under the Brown Act. This is not an emergency situation oh, no, under sorry. the Brown Act, which is um, a different situation entirely. Okay. So. Um, this is under the Brown Act provision that allows you to take immediate action on an item not on the agenda when the council makes a motion um, and determines that immediate action is necessary in the circumstance that you have here where the matter did not come to your attention until after the posting of the agenda. Okay, with that clarification, so moved. Okay, is there any member of the public who would like to speak to this? Okay, see none. Um, maybe have the call the vote. Councilmember Andrews? Yes. Councilmember Bailey? Yes. Councilmember Ravazio? Yes. Vice Mayor Condon? Yes. Mayor First? Yes. All right. So I'm going to put this at the end of the uh, business items. This will be our new agenda item 6.5. All right. So back to the regular agenda. Uh, next up is the consent calendar. The purpose of the consent calendar is to group items together which are routine or have been discussed previously and do not require further discussion. They will be approved by a single motion unless any member of the public, staff, or the council would like to remove an item. Uh, I'd like to uh, go 4.1.5. Pull that. I have some questions. All right. Let's pull 4.1.5. Anybody else want to pull anything? Okay, see none. I will entertain a motion to approve 4.1.1 through, and I'm just doing town items now, not sanitary district. Uh, so 4.1.1 through 4.1.10, excluding 4.1.5. So moved. Oh, go ahead. Second. Uh, okay. Carla got the first. <laughs> Sloan got the second. Would you please call the vote? Councilmember Andrews? Yes. Councilmember Bailey? Yes. Councilmember Vavazio? Yes. Vice Mayor Condon? Yes. Mayor First? Yes. All right. Let's uh, go to 4.1.5. Uh, Jim, would you like to? Yes. This uh, is basically uh, a resolution uh, to call uh, an election for council members this June. I have basically four questions. If we pass this resolution, Will it limit the town's ability to place a ballot measure on the June, June consolidated ballot? No, it will not. Okay. Uh, if, if the town wanted to place a ballot measure uh, <laughs> uh, concerning maybe extending the sales tax override and or repealing the flood control parcel tax, does such a ballot measure have to be done when the council members are facing election, or could it be done at any election? Extending your sales tax measure would need to be done at the town's general election unless there was the, um, a supermajority of the council 
voted um, that and made findings that there was a fiscal emergency to warrant it being on an off-cycle calendar. Right. Um, with respect to repealing of the, um, the attacks, that can be done <coughs> at any election that you choose. Okay. And then uh, when is the last day the council could authorize su such a ballot measure if we hope to get it on the June ballot? Um, the general rule under state law is 88 days, but that does require us to check in with the county registrar of voters who may have different procedures, and I'm understanding from the clerk that the last day is March 9th. March 9th. March 9th. Okay. Thank you. Uh, further questions would probably need to be agendized, so thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Anybody else have any questions or comments on form, on this item? Okay, I'll move to uh, approve 4.1.5. Second. Any member of the public like to speak to this? Seeing none, could we please call the vote? Councilmember Andrews? Yes. Councilmember Bailey? Yes. Councilmember Ravazio? Yes. Vice Mayor Condon? Yes. Mayor First? Yes. Thank you. Let's move on to the Sanitary District Consent Calendar Item 4.2.1. Is there anybody who would like to discuss this? If not, I will entertain a motion. So moved. Second. <laughs> Any public comment? None? All right. Okay. The Sanitary District Board. Board Member Andrews. Yes. Board Member Bailey? Yes. Board Member Ravazio? Yes. Vice President Condon? Yes. President First? Yes. Thank you. Moving on to public hearing, there was one that had been con uh, originally on the <laughs> draft agenda. It has been moved or it has been continued to the January 16th council meeting. So let's move on now to business items. Agenda item 6.1. Continuation of discussion from December 5th Town Council meeting regarding possible action to change Mayor and Town Council reorganization procedure. Rebecca, would you, do you have a report for us? Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council Members. This item was continued from the December 5th meeting. Um, and was originally heard at the November 7th council meeting where we um, discussed the possibility of either extending council member um, the terms of the current mayor and vice mayor for another six months pending the results of the June 5th, 2018 election uh, versus reorganizing like we typically do in December. Thank you. Any questions? Any public comment on this? See none, I will bring it back for deliberation or a motion. Uh, we have three options here, according to the staff report um, and what Rebecca just laid out. So, thoughts? I think... Jim. I'm sorry. I think our tradition of one-year term for a mayor and vice mayor uh, should be, should be followed, and that it has worked well for the town over the last uh, you know a couple of decades, I believe, and I don't see the pressing need to change you know traditions that have worked uh, over the last couple of over the last two years. We've seen at the national level what happens when everybody just sort of ignores traditions and tears up norms and I really don't want to let's just set a precedent that we're going to do that at the local level. Well my opinion is that this is hardly tearing up norms. What happened is we are shifting from odd year elections to even year elections mm -hmm. to improve voter turnout. So because we have this odd term that is six months longer the question is, do we have the terms of mayor and vice mayor um, go along with that slightly extended six month longer term just to even up with the elections? So anyway. Okay. Well, Carla. Okay. Um, I feel really awkward 
advocating for myself. Um, if the council um, is voting, I feel, you know, it's awkward. Usually we just do a normal rotation. Um, but I do feel that there isn't the necessity to change the rule. Um, and I would certainly um, like, I would appreciate the opportunity to be our town's mayor again. Um, what I would say, though, to um, make things a little bit more workable with um, the changes due to the new law that has been enacted would be to serve um, not the whole year, but just up until the, um, after the June election, whatever the results were of the June election, and then that would put it back onto an even schedule. Um, also, if the council um, preferred if it, to keep consistent, if everybody wanted to keep their same committee assignments that they have, I'm fine with that too. Um, I don't see that um, there's a need to change unless somebody wants to. Um, but I feel that I've worked really hard the years that I've served, which is over 16 years, and that, um, that I feel that I've worked hard for that honor to represent the council and the town as its mayor. Thank you. Either of you want to comment on this? Well, as I said in the last meeting, um, to me, doing this now and then doing it again in six months, when there's three of us who are here tonight who may not be here in six months, um, creates issues and inconsistencies and a whole list of potential problems with reorganization. Having said that, though, I think what's most important here is we figure out how to get to consensus. Mm -hmm. To me, that's more important than anything else. I don't want to see this council end up in a situation like some of the other ones have around the county over something um, like this. And I don't know how to get there. I don't know what we need to do. But I'd like to hear, I mean, essentially we have, I think, two people who, who obviously want this position um, and deserve it. I've worked with both of you for many, many, many years. I have tremendous respect for both of you. Uh, obviously, you've done and provided great service for the town. Um, I didn't realize at the last meeting, Carla, that you were as interested in becoming mayor as, as you obviously are. Um, so I'm not sure what to do, quite frankly, and I, I, I wish I could tell you exactly what we should do, but I want to come back to you guys and see if there's a way we can figure out how to work this out so that we can make a 5-0 vote on what we want to do with this thing going forward. Yeah, I appreciate that, Bob. Okay. You, oh. Let's hear from Sloan, and then we'll try to figure this out. Cause you I mean, I'm, I'm good with either one of you to tell you the truth. Um, and I agree with uh, Bob's comments that we have had a very collegial council in the way that we seem to be able to work together. So it'd be nice if we could find a way that we can have it be 5-0, that's all. Okay. Listen, I have enjoyed my year as mayor. I do not want to step on anybody's toes by extending it if, if that's going to create any kind of hard feelings. That does, however, bring up the question of if Carla becomes mayor, who becomes <coughs> vice mayor? We've got three people up in June, three positions up in June. So any thoughts on how I would, I would propose we just flop the two positions and make you vice mayor. Are yeah. you good with that, Diane? I'd be fine with that. <laughs> Jim, are you good with that? Yeah. I take it you're good with that, Carla. Yes. All right, I so moved. <laughs> no, wait a second. We're, we're, okay. moving. we're moving. We're moving. That's not Yeah, that's we've we got to. <laughs> we have to do that at the end of the meeting. We don't disorganize the committee. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wait, the, what? <laughs> Uh, okay, Carla's so, suggestion of just leaving the committees as they are unless somebody really wants to move on from some, something to something else. Okay, so I think at this point we will not be going back and suspending or changing any of the council rules. 
we've had our discussion. We'll, I'll take public comment in just a minute. And then I'm guessing we don't do anything. And then this is actually reorganization of the town council is agenda item nine. So is that correct that we would not take any action on this agenda item other than hearing public comment? It would be up to you the order in which you do this. If you prefer to do your um, your formal vote on this and just have this be a discussion item and put that off, you could do that. You could move uh, item nine up forward. You could have um, I, I take effect that. after this meeting so that you end up with the same um, person presiding if you wanted to. So you could do any of those things. Okay, well this particular agenda item was about the procedure, possible action to change mayor and town council reorganization procedure. It sounds like we're not going to change the procedure. Right. So should we just continue on with the agenda and then we'll take care of the switch on and number I, nine? I Are you okay with that? Sure. She's already you okay with that? For, yeah, she's already done. She, she yeah. teed okay. up for okay. Diane studied for the meeting tonight. So yeah, let's, let's okay. leave the agenda as it is. I will call for public comment. Is there anybody who would like to uh, comment on this agenda item? Okay, seeing none, uh, we will move on to agenda item 6.2 study session and possible direction to staff regarding noise ordinance update and leaf blower regulations. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Um, I'd like to first just introduce our team uh, that has worked on uh, the staff report and the heavy loading was uh, really from Catherine McGrath. She's an associate with our town attorney's office. So welcome, Catherine. I thought I would start her off uh, light, you know, like on the noise ordinance issue that we talked oh. about for the last decade. Uh, <laughs> and also, uh, no introduction, but uh, our, our police chief, Mike Norton from Central Men Police Authority is also here. And tonight, um, really uh, is an update. It's a study session for the council and the community. Really what I'm hoping, um, what I'm hoping to, to gain uh, from this meeting is um, that I'm headed down the right path. And if I'm not, please uh, refocus me and uh, staff will go whatever way we need to. Um, and so really there's, there's a, a series of recommendations uh, how I see, um, and I really would appreciate your uh, constructive feedback uh, on next steps. But really tonight I look at this as an overview of uh, where we are at this point of how we really look at as staff and, and legally, how we look at our ordinance and where we see the issues. Um, and really bringing this back for uh, public input and feedback in tonight's meeting in any direction council would wish to provide staff. And then really go from there and um, surveys are hit or miss. I think we have some good staff with Lorena to really take some of the um, the messaging that we get tonight and really all the work we've done over the years and really look at a, a survey or a way to gain some feedback from the community um, on where we are because I, my sense is that we're split as a community. Quality of life issues are very difficult and it's why we haven't problem solved this and quite frankly, and Catherine can speak to this up and down the state, no one really has done a good job of, of really speaking to noise as a quality of life issue in their communities. I mean, it's really, really difficult. Um, and I just think, you know, having some feedback um, in the right way, and I haven't completely wrapped my head around what that looks like, but I'm thinking about doing something like that, of surveying our community to get a consensus on certain themes within our quality of life issues in Corte Madera related to noise. And then coming back in a series of smaller community meetings with staff and the community to see if we can come to some consensus with what we're talking about. And then ultimately to come back to council instead of us trying to problem solve this in three meetings, three hours at a time at the dais, which is very difficult to do, I hope to come back to you and say, hey, look, I think we've solved 80% of these five issues we've outlined. There's 20% we need your help with council and, and to give you a series of options uh, to ultimately make the decision because ultimately you will have to make a decision and it's probably going to be related, related to the leaf blowers. Well, I think we know that. Uh, but I think we can solve everything else. Uh, through this process, um, and I think we can actually um, set the council up for success um, with the leaf blowers as well. And, and so that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking of a of a multiple months type of process coming back to you in the summer, ultimately with where we're at, uh, depending how quickly we can do the survey and have the community meetings. And so that's what I was thinking about process-wise. But again, um, please direct me um, as you may. 
Um, again, I want to provide a little bit of background. Um, this, we did make a number of staff reports for everyone in the public. If, uh, if you'd like to see the staff report, it is in the back of the room. And so I'm not going to cover everything. I'm going to hit some highlights and really open it up to the community to provide some feedback and then get this to you, um, ultimately to confirm or direct me as needed. Um, as you know, we've talked about this for a period of years. Uh, in late 2015, early 2016, um, staff came to the town with some recommendations regarding the noise ordinance. We had a series of issues. Our noise ordinance is really, um, right now, it's subjective, and we need it to be objective. And, and, and Catherine laid out those issues in the staff report really eloquently, but we really struggled with that in 2016. And so the council, as it related to the overall noise ordinance, we made some minor changes, but we focused on the leaf blowers and narrowed the scope of the use of times, really. Um, and so over the past 18 months, we really came back. We've heard a lot of feedback from council members and the community to keep working at it. And so this is a culmination of that work. We directed uh, the town attorney to help us with that. Catherine took the lead. And really what Catherine did is when she, and it's on the bottom of page one, when she took all the concerns raised by staff and the community, um, really looked at the effectiveness and the forcibility of our ordinance, um, she came up with a series of best practices that we considered and identified five areas of concern, and they're listed as the following. That we should consider establishing objective enforcement standards. Again, right now, ours, ours aren't objective. Um, it's two, to improve the ease of the enforceability. Three, to expand the sources of noise that are subject to the local noise regulations. Four, modify the current leaf blower restrictions. And five, modify the penalty provisions to provide greater consistency and clarity. Um, and so when you look at the enforcement standards, again, right now they're subjective. And so I, I just, my analogy, and, and Mike might have a different one, but it's kind of like for our police officers, for the people that have to enforce this, you always have discretion on quality of life issues, right? But you have to have objective standards. So 10 times out of 10 times, you're seeing the same thing. So it's like a stop sign violation. You either stop at the limit line or you don't, okay? It's subjective. Right now it's not. We have issues of, um, kids playing in the streets. There's an argument that that could be a violation of the noise ordinance for currently. I mean, it, that's where, and that's what got us here, swim, you know, our swimming pools. Um, so we, we we're in this, this really difficult area of enforcement standards. And so I believe, based on the feedback we've had from staff and council, that, that staff can problem solve section one. So I believe we can come back to you with objective standards. So I'm confident in that. Secondly, the ease of enforceability. Um, again, I think it's something at a staff level um, we, can, we can work towards. Um, again, it, it's, it's taking best practices, really updating our, our, our old noise ordinance. The sources of noise in Section 3, I think that is one that will we'll come back with the study, um, with the survey, and in the community meetings, but it's identifying the sources of noise, being really specific what we're talking about. Because we identify some sources and we leave other sources out. Again, I think that's something we can work at at the staff level. The leaf blowers. Um, so again, leaf blowers, a lot of discussion in the county on that. Currently, when you look at the lay of the land in our community uh, in Marin County, we have four outright bans uh, on leaf blowers, Belvedere, uh, Tiburon, Mill Valley, Larkspur recently, uh, as you're aware, um, um, in instituted a ban. What they did though is they did differentiate, and Catherine covers it in her staff report, um, between commercial and residential, and also um, dense residential apartments, allowing um, those those areas to have leaf blowers and really took the input and feedback from the landscaper labor groups and, and unions uh, taking their feedback and, and incorporating that. Um, we have a number of uh, cities and towns where one of them that restrict uh, times and days of the use. That's currently Corte Madera, San Anselmo, Fairfax. Ross is unique. They actually um, mandate a permit. So you have to go through a permitting process to use leaf blowers and then San Anselmo. And then there are three agencies that allow uh, leaf blowers uh, completely, uh, and again, that's Novato, Sausalito, and Unincorporated Marin. I hope through the, the process tonight of just making sure we're right on, on the right path, it would be really helpful if council felt one way or the other on an outright ban or not. I mean, that's helpful because that'll save me a lot of time. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> if we're not there exactly, I think there's some themes, right? It's, okay, are we gonna, do we wanna consider a ban? Okay, that's good. 
then are we going to consider, and I would heavily, strongly recommend that you differentiate between something similar to what Larkspur did, between commercial and residential. Um, and then you get into the issue, if you're going to ban it, do you see differences between um, the noise pollution between uh, powered and electric? And so I think those are some things that I, we don't necessarily need to get into the weeds tonight, but I think that's something I, I do think it's helpful to get feedback from the community. Um, it might not carry the day for you, but it would be helpful maybe for the council to know that. Um, I'll tell you that restricting days and times, I just, it's really difficult. And, and Mike, at the end, if you would like um, some, ask some questions uh, of the police department about that, Mike is here to uh, speak to that as well. Um, and then lastly, the penalties. Our current ordinance um, has a, a number of sections that uh, certain violations are misdemeanors, certain violations are infractions, and then certain are administrative. Really, uh, when we look at our ordinances, especially related to noise, they should be infractions, staff would recommend, and so we're gonna work on that. Um, we do have administrative processes that are very costly and timely for staff, and so we're gonna look at a process that uh, is obviously fair to our community, but is streamlined for us and makes sense. It's something we can enforce, um, and obviously uh, without using and expending an, an enormous amount of uh, resources to do that. Um, and so that's what the staff report really does. It outlays those five areas. Um, I think we're headed down the right path. I think we have a good team to problem solve that. I definitely, it's gonna be difficult to try to mirror other agencies within the Central Marin to help our police. Uh, San Anselmo, Corte Madera, and Larkspur are just different, and you're just gonna have differences. There are some positives to what Larkspur did. There's also some, some things that might not necessarily be beneficial to us, but we can talk about that if you'd like to get into it. Um, but I think we're headed down the right path. I just don't want to institute anything that um, is problematic and un unenforceable for our police department or our code enforcement officers. Um, and so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions, but my thought was to open it up to the community, get some feedback, and then bring it back to the council for questions in any direction. Okay, any questions? No, are we gonna, are we gonna hear from Mike at some point? Absolutely. Sorry. Okay, that's all right. I don't have anything specific to present, okay. but I'm just up Good here enough. for questions. Uh, so no questions? I'll wait till after everybody has their bed and then we can talk a little bit. All right, Carla? Yeah. Over here, Jim. Uh, let me see, do we deal with noise in our general plan? And will we have to sort of wrap that into this whole process? Go we on. do, I have talked to uh, Adam about <coughs> that. There are certain, okay. certain areas, yes. All right. Bob, anything? Um, are we going to ask questions now or, or later? Questions now. Okay. Uh, then two questions. One, uh, if there is a survey, um, do we have a means to ensure that <clears throat> it doesn't turn into a popularity contest? You know, not unlike what happened with the, the net neutrality thing recently at the federal level, that people stuff the ballot box. Can we just make sure? And, and you don't have to answer it now, but that would just be my one concern with the surveys to ensure that there's a, a one vote, one person kind of... <laughs> rule can you yeah. do that maybe yeah. one per IP address yeah yeah it's a, it's a that's a, it's a big conversation of is this even possible and so Lorena uh, we've been talking to and has done a lot of surveys up and down the, it, within the state she believes so and so that that is going to be can we do that with a mechanism and, and ensure that it's one vote and it doesn't become a popularity contest we believe we can but we're working on it great yeah. thank you and then for Chief Norton and if you think this is appropriate to answer later that's fine but I, I would like to just know what the police force's experience with the, the Larkspur ordinance is because um, that's been in effect for a while and, and you, you, you guys are the ones on the front line for this, right? Right, when right. There's a, when so there's we, a problem, you're the one that shows up. Yeah, we have seen a, an obvious uh, increase in calls once it was enacted. Um, it's, I would say, um, it's probably similar to um, before it was enacted, we got to San Anselmo a lot because our ordinance had been around, and now we're seeing Larkspur. Probably we're going out about as much as we do for San Anselmo, so an increase for calls for service. But generally, um, we're going out and making contact, and it's really been um, educational, to be honest with you. Um, to, to bring up the stop sign thing again, um, I think all of us know when we get a driver's license, we have to learn the rules of the road. So we know if we're speeding or stopping, or not stopping, that we're violating the law, and we'll could get a ticket or we could get a warning, but we know that we're doing something wrong, right? Same with parking. Um, generally, if you park, you know if you don't put money in the meter, there's a chance you could get a ticket. What we find with these quality of life issues is the first time we contact people, most of them are just unaware of it. 
even if you have a, a large turnout at a public meeting, you know, your, your jurisdiction could be over 10,000 people and 30 people were here. They don't know that you, all of a sudden you can't use leaf blowers. So, or they are hiring people that don't know. So what we've generally found is um, it's an education. And once we tell people, hey, you've got to stop, not only do they comply right away, but we don't ever get called back on that same residence or that same worker. So it, it's a good way that generally works with most quality of life issues where, um, you know, we make a note and record the person's name. So if we do get another call on them, we, then we, the officer would have more, be more likely to issue a citation, but generally we try and do an education first. But we do get a lot of calls in the beginning because you have to educate 10,000 people. So it takes some time. Okay, Jim. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, of the ordinances, which ones are easiest to explain to the gardeners who, <laughs> you, know, you know, the professional gardeners or how you know, cooperative are they? Or I think it's difficult for them because I think a lot of them work all over our county and our county is mm -hmm. comprised of, I'm not sure how many small cities and towns with different, with about 13, 14. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone, like um, the town manager said, has a completely different ordinance. So we, our, spin, our officers had sometimes spend just trying to keep track of three towns and all the different rules. I'm not sure how the, the gardeners really do it, to be honest with you. Um, along that line, do you have any sense as to how the, the gas-powered leaf blower ban has been working in Tiburon and Belvedere and those other towns that have adopted that? I personally have no information on that. Okay. Todd, no? Okay, thank you. Oh. Peter Brown? <laughs> Madam Mayor, members of the council, Santa Barbara uh, has a similar policy to Tiburon and Belvedere. Um, electric leaf blowers are allowed, and gas powered ones are not. Um, that was enacted about two years ago, and the community response was quite positive. It took a while. I think there was a grace period um, prior to the enactment or after the enactment where they said, okay, contractors, gardening companies, landscaping companies, you have until such and such a date. Um, there's a lot of information that went out. Uh, but I think that <clears throat> certainly in that example, um, it, it did make a difference. Uh, they're not silent, but they are significantly less of a disturbance, uh, at least in Santa Barbara's experience. Thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, I will open it up for public comment. Uh, I will allow up to three minutes. Is there any member of the public who would like to speak to this? If so, please approach the podium. State your name and where you live. Uh, we keep a timer <coughs> on the screen. You'll see in that little rectangle, the red outline will, will move to the right and take, eventually take up the um, whole outline of the rectangle when you're getting close to your three minutes. Uh, if there is anybody who would like to speak after uh, Dr. Bundy, please, you know, line up so we can get through this. Thank you. Okay, uh, Madam Mayor, Council Members, uh, I had also called around to some of the other communities, and in, uh, in particular, I think Mill Valley and Belvedere had been told that uh, they had not had problems uh, once it had gotten established and it was just not getting used. Uh, I also just want to say that I think we're probably at a tipping point in uh, the, the use of battery and electric powered equipment. They now have battery backpacks uh, that commercial landscapers can use. Uh, I personally use an electric, but I use it, mostly have it on vacuum, uh, you know, works very effectively. I think one of the problems that uh, people have is the noise to work ratio uh, for gas powered leaf blowers is uh, really uh, not appreciated. Uh, you, you know, the stories of people chasing one or two leaves down the street and the noise seems to go on for a prolonged period of time, whereas if somebody's using something like a chainsaw uh, or a trimmer, a uh, shorter period of time you see work gets done. Uh, I think that uh, this is the time to do something that's really simple. I think banning uh, gas-powered leaf blowers, leaving electric battery uh, for any time use. Uh, I would also hope that uh, maybe there could be some cooperation with Larkspur and San Anselmo to come up with the same ban to really make it easier uh, for the, our police to enforce this. 
Um, but I think we're at the point where we can really do that. I also really wanted to make a pitch uh, for the environment that uh, gas-powered leaf blowers and really two-stroke gas-powered equipment is much more polluting than an automobile. And we have these spare the air days where we're asked not to drive unnecessarily or have a fire in the fireplace, yet these uh, gas-powered leaf blowers and other gas-powered equipment are putting out more pollution than if you had driven to San Francisco for work or any other reason. So I think uh, the state of California is trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, there are also particulate emissions, fugitive dust that these things stir up, and that this is sort of the low-hanging fruit from the standpoint that this is something that we could do that would reduce those greenhouse gases, but also improve the uh, quality of life in uh, Corte Madera and maybe Larkspur and San Anselmo if we could get together on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Vince Durham. I live here in Corte Madera, and I'm actually a proponent of the, the gas blower. I wanted to uh, respectfully ask the City Council to very carefully consider a ban on, on blowers. Um, there were many people throughout the community that I'm familiar with where gas blowers are in daily use. Um, there are a lot of members of the community that probably have no idea that this meeting is taking place tonight or that there's any discussion of a ban on leaf blowers. Um, my emphasis would be to meet on kind of a, a middle ground and that would be perhaps ours. I know there's been some sort of discussion with regards to the city of Larkspur. In my opinion, it's business as usual in Larkspur. Um, the, the, the blowers are just used there all the time. Lastly, I want to speak to Todd's suggestion about a survey that would be done throughout the community and then also to Mike Norton's uh, officers. Law enforcement has enough problems on their plate right now, and I think it would be a mistake to, to have law enforcement have interaction with the public uh, as far as enforcement of this, because I think social justice will come into play. And at the end of the day, it will be the homeowner who's given a ticket and anyone else would be given a pass. So I encourage the town council to think carefully before coming up with an outright ban. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak to this item? Patty Stolier, Casa Buena Drive. Um, we use a um, commercial landscape company at the condominium where I live, and they have to accommodate all the places that you can't use a gas blower, so they have to have an electric one to work all throughout Marin. So I don't think it's a big imposition on them to say you can't use um, a gas blower anymore. So that's one thing. And the other is the enforceability. Uh, what happens with the um, uh, uh, burn ban days? Do, do I know you were saying about social peers reporting everybody, but does that happen? And, and is there someone sent out to enforce that turn your fireplace off. So I, I wondered about the enforceability because we struggle with that all the time on a condo level is, yeah, it's great to say you must get your chimney inspected, but how are you going to enforce it? Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other member of the public who would like to speak? Seeing none, I will close public comment and bring it back to council for discussion. Sloan. I have a question. I don't know who's right. Todd, probably. Is this a planning issue? Do we need the planning commission to figure this out? No? I didn't hear anything from our, <laughs> our uh, from, except Todd, well, but, uh, but Bob's on the planning down. commission, so we got one, one guy, but uh, what do you reckon? I think this comes down to a, a quality of life is one of the top three issues in our community, and this is a huge quality of life issue. It, it really rests with the council, and I don't think it would be. We can't punt it. <laughs> and and uh, I might also mention that this is really kind of two issues in one. There's the leaf blowers, but then there's the noise ordinance right. in general. So really we're talking about kind of both. So. so, I mean, my own preliminary is, Todd, I think you're sort of on the right track uh, with sort of the concept. I'll just tell you guys, I don't I take seriously all the comments and concerns. If what we're debating is the noise from leaf blowers, we've won. 
like we as a community, if that's our problem, um, then you know we have uh, we. It's something that I don't. Min- I suppose it sounds like I'm minimizing. I just I get a sense of it's kind of awesome if that's what we're debating is how loud are the leaf blowers in our neighbors' yards. Um, I know how troubling it can be to some people, but I, I honestly don't have a strong feeling one way or the other. So I will. I'm fascinated to hear what my brothers and sisters have to say. All right. I love that. Um, I think the idea of a survey is really helpful. Um, there have been just a handful of residents um, for the last at least five years that have been really vocal about um, their opposition to the gas blowers. And I think that um, just in light of some of the um, the letters that we have in our packet tonight from other people that discouraged um, the ban, that I think it would be helpful just so that we can be fair in representing um, the majority of the people. Um, in looking at the whole before we even have a result, I would think that our public works, don't they use gas blowers? I mean, when you're talking about the park, to have an extension cord to go so far is is ridiculous. You just, it, it's just difficult to, um, to do. And so I think that we really need to analyze what is most efficient for whom. And um, I really don't think if we're, if we're talking about town center or town park, these public areas, that, um, that there would be the necessity to ban the use of their um, leaf blowers if there's no disruption in the sound. Um, but I think that, um, that the um, survey would be really helpful and that also, if there's any way that we can in some way keep consistent with Larkspur so that our Central Marin Police are, are looking for the, the town boundary <clears throat> to see what laws they're going to enforce or not enforce, I think it's important that, that we do arrive at some consistency. Thank you. Sure. Bob. Um, first off, this was a great report. Thank you. Um, and, and I have to, it's really thorough, because I gotta tell you, that, you know, the way this is written, as I was reading it, I saw all these steps you wanted to do, and I'm thinking, this is a noise ordinance. What are we doing here? Come on, you know, why do we need all this time? But then as I went through it and I read it, it became very clear that this is far more complex, and to do it right, which I think we really need to do, um, is going to take some time and some study and some energy, and I think you're approaching it in exactly the right way. Um, just something we may, we keep talking about the survey. I think the survey is a great idea. As I mentioned earlier, I would be concerned about making sure that the ballot box doesn't get stuffed in some way. And also, you need to look at survey results. I, I worked in marketing for a long time, and this type of survey is self-selective, right? The people who are interested are the ones who are going to vote. So we need to look at that with that eye, and we also need to look at all this other information that you're getting, too. You can't just look at the survey and say, oh, it said this, and say that's the decision. I think you need to take it in the context of all these other meetings and all the other decisions and how it fits with Larkspur laws and everything else. Um, but I think this is a terrific way to approach it. I think we do need to approach it carefully and thoughtfully. We need to have an ordinance that is enforceable and eliminates some of the issues we've had in the past where there's been contentiousness over whether or not we have anything that's actually enforceable or not. So great job on doing this, and I heartily endorse the, the plan you've laid out. Thank you. Thank you. Jim? Uh, yeah, I'd like to make a suggestion that uh, we had outfit our staff with sort of prototype electric uh, leaf blowers just so that we can get a survey from them <coughs> whether or not they work, you know, and just let our staff be the guinea pig for for it initially. Uh, the idea of making ourselves be consistent with Larkspur, that makes sense. Uh, hopefully if we come up with a better ordinance, they will 
you know, steal our good ideas and we can go forward from there. Um, and then just a differentiation, difference separating uh, uh, gas powered from electric will do a, a lot towards reducing the, the noise. Uh, I do believe that a lot of our, there'll be some people in town who are just against uh, leaf blowers in general due to the du uh, dust it stirs up, but you know, we might be able to get at least part of the way there, which is reducing the noise level. But anyway. Okay. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to commend Catherine for a really terrific um, staff report. It was very, very good. It was so good, I really have very little to add about the noise ordinance portion. Um, I think you're right on. Um, I think delineating the standards by zoning district um, is very important. Establishing ambient levels, all that, you're right on. Um, there was a comment from a gentleman about enforcement. I would anticipate the enforcement really in, in real life will likely happen on the noise, noise issues, not necessarily leaf blowers. I don't want to see our central Marin police out there trying to ticket, you know, wayward gas powered uh, leaf blower users if um, we indeed go forward with the ban. Did you want to add something? I just wanted to comment on. Um on enforcement of leaf blowers as they currently exist in our whole jurisdiction or noise, um, you know, 99.9 percent, .9 they're complaint driven. So our officers are not driving around and using their time looking for <laughs> someone with a leaf blower or maybe a stereo too loud or something. They're out doing traffic enforcement, they're out um, taking reports, and they're all trying to stop crime, which is what their main goal Thank is. Thank mission. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so thank you. Glad to hear that. <laughs> if we do move forward and ban leaf blowers, um, I would love to see the first line of attack for any complaints would be to send that person a PDF that they can print out and hand to the person um, with the town's rules, something like that. Likewise, I would like to see some kind of a handout that maybe we could post on next door that folks could print out and give to their landscaping companies outlining what the law is. It can be in both English and Spanish or whatever languages um, we deem appropriate. Um, I would not support restricting days and times for leaf blowers. I think that's too difficult for the landscapers to schedule their work. I don't think it's fair to these folks who are trying to make a living to limit them too much beyond what we've already kind of set up in our in our ordinance, which I think is reasonable. Um, I do want to maybe check in with Belvedere and Tiburon and maybe Santa Barbara, I don't know, wherever, um, to ensure things are working well with either electric or battery um, blowers. I think it's very sensible to have a different rule for public and commercial versus residential. I think one of the main complaints that we've been getting are noise related, uh, are related to the noise of, of gas blowers, and that's for folks that are working from home or maybe um, work at night and sleep during the day. Um, it's really the noise aspect that is the most um, disruptive. Um, I'd like to um, echo a couple of my fellow council members that I think it's important that we coordinate with Larkspur and San Anselmo. Um, if at all possible, we should have one set of rules for all three, three cities if um, that's workable because I, I hate to see the Central Marin Police um, have to follow three different sets of rules. And I might say it might not be a bad idea to reach out to the Marin managers and try to, you know, coordinate around the county, um, if at all possible, especially with regard to limiting days if there are certain cities. Um, you know, let's try to accomplish reducing noise, cleaning the air, all those kinds of things um, without implementing a, a dozen different rules throughout the county. 
Um, and with regard to the survey, I think it's important that we delineate kind of noise issues from leaf blowers, maybe even have two separate surveys, or I don't even know that people want to give us feedback on the noise ordinance per se, but maybe it just needs to be a leaf blower survey. Um, and I would also echo that I don't want this to be a popularity contest, so if we can somehow um, keep track of, you know, the the residence or the IP address or something so we don't have people stacking that. Okay, anybody have anything to add to that? Uh, just one thing is that, that um, I hope that the people that have for the last several years um, <coughs> had this as one of their primary gripes in town, that they know that we are actually being active in trying to come to some resolution and that we're not just putting it off. Thank you. All right. Do you have sufficient direction? Thank you. That's very helpful. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And it was nice to meet you, Catherine. Thanks for coming tonight. All righty. Moving on uh, to agenda item 6.3, discussion regarding a pension stabilization trust and consideration and possible action on resolution uh, and various other uh, item sub items under agenda item 6.3 on the agenda okay thank you madam mayor members of the council i'm going to turn this over to the finance director daria carrillo in one uh, moment um, and we also have uh, nick from keenan who's here to answer any questions as well um, again i just uh, i'm really proud of the steps that this council and the town has taken over the past uh, couple years related to unfunded liabilities specifically related to uh, our pensions um, you may recall uh, back earlier uh, this year we did our normal uh, gatsby analysis of our unfunded liabilities uh, for pensions but what we, we did is we took an additional step and we really looked at the conversation uh, surrounding pensions and as we know calpers is moving to from a seven and a half percent discount rate to a 7% discount rate. But as we uh, analyze it further, and really with the leadership of, of the mayor, Diane First, and council member James Andrews, um, we wanted to know really what that discount rate should be. And, and we asked um, Bartell to do an analysis um, on where they thought we should fall. And they believe uh, that over the next 10 years, the discount rate average will be approximately 6.2%. But they, they really looked out 30 years out, and, and their recommendation was, it's probably going to be somewhere around 6%. And so what we did is we started to analyze uh, options for us. Uh, we had just paid off the last side fund payment. It's approximately $366,000. Um, and we held that money in advance to see what options we had available to us. And um, in our council meeting, uh, after that report, council directed us to come back and look at options. One of those was a 115 trust. It's very similar to what we do with our retiree health benefits. We have a 115 trust. Um, it can only be used uh, for our uh, health benefits moving forward. Um, and it's been very successful. As you know, when you compare us to other agencies, most of them are, gonna, are trying to pay off their unfunded liabilities over 30, 40 year estimates. As you know, ours will be paid off in 15 to 16 years based on uh, the steps that we took with retiree health. So we try to take that philosophy and look at pensions and what can we do. Um, and Keenan, uh, there are three vendors that uh, provide this service. We are recommending Keenan uh, for a number of reasons and I'll let the finance director speak to that. Um, but what we're asking uh, for your consideration tonight is a number of actions. Um, and it, it's really to open our 115 trust with Keenan and to make the first deposit of $366,000 into this uh, trust. Um, we are not held to that deposit annually. That, that is kind of what the recommendation of our team is at this point. By doing this, really what it allows us to do, it allows us to project cost at a 6% discount rate moving forward. Um, and you see it in some of the other cities with the county and San Rafael, you know, they're paying anywhere up to 68% plus um, of their payroll towards pension costs. Right now we're at 38%. There are estimates that it could jump to 61% over the next decade. By opening this trust, this will allow us to control cost um, at approximately a 40% rate. And it's very important for the viability of our town and allow us flexibility. And so with that, I'm really happy to introduce Daria, ask her to give the staff report. And again, uh, Nick from Keenan is here as well to answer any questions. Thank you. Good 
evening, Mayor and Town Council members. As the Town Manager just explained, this item concerns um, the consideration and possible action regarding the Pension Stabilization Trust, which would be administered by Keenan. And um, just by way of background, the town's current unfunded pension liability as of June of 2016, which is the last actuarial study done by PERS, is approximately $18 million. And in the current year, the, the town's required unfunded uh, liability payment was approximately $976,000. And in the next fiscal year, CalPERS estimates that the payment will be 1.2 million and then more than 1.4 million in the following year. And this is in addition to normal cost PERS pensions, um, which is paid as a, cost, a, a percentage of payroll. And in the current year, that was about $474,000. So um, regarding this issue, the town, as um, the town manager just mentioned, um, received a report <coughs> from its actuarial firm, Bartell Associates, last April um, to receive some guidance with respect to reducing some of these pension liabilities and to plan for the volatility in the future required payments to PERS. And there were a few options presented at the time. And the one that the council directed staff to look into was the Pension Stabilization Trust. And um, as part of the adopted budget, $366,000 um, for such a trust was included in that budget. Um, and that number was arrived at, the $366,000 as an initial payment, because that was the amount of an annual side fund payment, which the town had paid off in 2016-17. and. Um, just for everyone's benefit, the side fund is the amount that was calculated by PERS um, when small plans were pooled in the early 2000s. That was the amount that PERS calculated as the safety plan's liability, and it was required to be paid off over a number of years, and now has. And the town's miscellaneous um, plan also has a side fund of about, excuse me, $230,000 of annual payments, which will be paid off in 2019-20. And so since the town no longer needs to pay that safety fund payment, um, that was the thinking behind where the $366,000 came from. That would be used to fund the, the trust. And so as um, is uh, listed in the staff report, the use of um, the trust had several um, benefits. First of all, it could help to offset some of that volatile pension um, activity because funds transferred to CalPERS are at the town's discretion. It can be used to offset the fluctuations in the annual um, required contributions. And the assets can be accessed at any time to offset um, CalPERS rate increases. Um, also, by using a trust of this, of this nature, um, the town will maintain oversight of investment um, strategies and have control over the risk tolerance. Um, instead of just sending um, funds to CalPERS for investment, where, of course, the town would not have any control over what CalPERS might do, um, the funds would be invested in the Section 115 Pension Stabilization Trust, which allows for um, the town to choose an investment strategy. There's um, flexibility in the investments as uh, compared to some restrictions that are placed on the town general fund in, in accordance with the California government code. Um, also, by having assets in a trust of this nature, um, those would offset pension liabilities, and that would be reported in the town's financial statements as opposed to just setting money aside in the town's own internal trust or something like that. It, um, that wouldn't um, show up on the balance sheet. Um, and also funds in invested in a trust can only be used for pension obligations. It can't be used for anything else, and that would ensure that in the future no one could, you know, decide to use it um, for something else. Um, and the town has discretion. Um, on the amount to invest, if any, in the trust each year, and the and the amounts can be increased or decreased as the council um, decides. And so, with this in mind, staff contacted Keenan, um, and as um, the town manager indicated, there's a representative Nick Gedestad is here from Keenan 
to answer any questions about the, the program itself. But Keenan um, is the town's um, broker for dental insurance and just recently um, um, uh, helped us get new dental insurance and also is going to provide the dental insurance for the Central Marin um, Fire Authority and also for um, the life insurance as well. And so Keenan um, has partnered with Benefit Trust Company who would be the trustee and Morgan Stanley Wealth Management to provide a multi-employer um, trust, with, which is an investment process for small agencies. And um, it, in this trust, the town's assets would be segregated, would be held just as the town's assets, not as with PERS, where that's not allowed. Um, also, um, choosing... Um, uh, the town can choose its own investment policy, as I mentioned, um, and this multi-employer trust um, would have economies of scale and would save on fees. And as I mentioned, the town can um, change its contributions at any t at any town at any time. Um, and if the town does approve. Um, joining this trust administered by Keenan, um, then the, t the next steps would be that the town would be required to join um, the California um, Entities Board of Authority, which is a board that would work with Keenan, and the responsibilities um, and duties of the board are listed on one of the attachments. It's primarily to review the investments, but um, which would be taken care of by Benefit Trust Company, and. Um, would um, the town would be required to appoint a staff as a representative and an alternate to that board um, the town would also need to designate an investment strategy and the investment strategies available are listed in this um, staff report on an, uh, an attachment and they range from um, fixed income to moderate growth and, ba um, and based on the performance that's listed in here from over a one-year period, a three-year period, and a five-year period, um, staff recommends um, moderate growth. And then finally, um, the town would need to transfer this $366,000 into the, the trust. Uh, thanks, Daria. So again, um, a couple weeks ago, um, staff, Daria and myself, along with Mayor First and Councilman Andrews, met with Keenan and the team and had a, heard the presentation, asked questions, and again, this recommendation is coming from uh, the four of us, and we're happy to answer any questions. Okay, any questions? Down here? Um, I just wanted to um, ask for you to maybe clarify a little bit about the Board of Authority. I know, Daria, you mentioned that well, it's not a pooled investment. It is um, a multi-agency account, but we would have our own account. We choose our own strategy, uh, investment strategy. But could you discuss the, the Board of Authority and how that would work? And also maybe that we will be the first agency. Yes. Um, Keenan, I, as I understand it, administers trusts for about 100 um, school districts and community colleges in California and some um, municipalities, but I, we would be the first in this multi-employer trust, if that's correct. I'll, for pensions. Yes, for pensions. Um, although I believe that um, there, the, uh, we were told there were five to eight others that were pending joining yeah. this. Is that right? Okay. And so, yes, the town of Corte Madera would be the first um, member of this multi-employer trust. Um, and actually, um, that was w one of the reasons we, we chose Keenan, that the multi-employer trust was available um, and we could segregate out our, our assets, which I don't think is allowed in the other um, companies who provide this. I think you have to keep everything together um, so the the board of authorities um, responsibilities are attached and it, it says um, here that the board of authority is directly responsible for the implementation and oversight of the investment policy statement and then it goes on um, to discuss the investment policy and state that um, the Board of Authority will meet periodically with the trustee, which is Benefit Trust Company, to review investment performance um, reports that analyze the performance of the managers, 
selected in, in each market sector that take into consideration, and then it goes on um, to list several things, including adherence to applicable legal constraints on prudent investment, consistency and adherence to stated investment management style and discipline, risk-adjusted performance relative to managers with similar styles, uh, long-term investment performance relative to appropriate benchmarks and changes in investment um, uh, personnel managing the portfolio. So it would be actually benefit trust company that over oversees this, but I guess a board of authority is needed to execute documents and to give direction regarding investment strategy and, and that, things of that nature. Thank you. So just to clarify, this is actually creating a whole new entity, this board of authority. The town, if we approve this, the town of Corte Madera will be the first agency, and thus whoever we assign to be our representative will be the chair of that particular authority. But the benefit to doing this it, this way is you have eventually multiple municipalities in this one authority, and you can help share the costs. So the management costs for this trust account will be much less than if we had gone to benefit trust and said, please open a trust account for just us, and they do the whole account management and charge us a ton of fees. So that's kind of yeah, how it's organized. Yeah. Jim, you want to? Yeah, I guess play? coming from the mutual fund world, the, the best analogy I can come up with is if somebody wanted to set up their own mutual fund, what they would do is they'd go to a custodian, transfer agent, and very often they would have a legal structure already set up, and you would, in effect, have a series within that legal structure. <coughs> and over above the legal structure, there's a board of, tru board of directors or a board of trustees. And so the analogy would be this... Uh, uh, you know, our you know our portfolio would be one of the series under that trust, and the board of authority is in effect the uh, trustees or this, the legal uh, board of directors over the whole trust. In terms of the cost, it looks like it'll be ten basis points for each of the three agencies who are involved in it. Uh, Morgan Stanley, which will, which are, which, who are selecting the uh, mutual funds that are used to build the uh, strategy, uh, gets 10 basis points. Uh, Keenan gets 10, and Benefit Trust also gets 10 basis points. And my experience is that the cost, you know, those costs are very reasonable if you're trying to build uh, an investment structure like this, so. Carla. Yeah, I have a question. Could you explain to me um, where you have the um, spreadsheet for the model portfolios and portfolio returns? Um, they're real favorable, and I was just wondering, how does that apply to the town? Um, is this something that we would be involved in? What are the conditions that relate to these? I, I believe that the, the town chooses which of the investment strategies it would like. And then um, Morgan Stanley invests according to what we've chosen. Maybe Nick would not mind um, explaining it a little bit. Okay, so the uh, depends on which investment portfolio you're in. So the council or the board gets to choose which one Corte Madera would uh, enter into. So you have between fixed income and the aggressive portfolios. At that point, uh, Morgan Stanley will recommend uh, different funds to Benefit Trust Company. Um, in turn, Benefit Trust will look at uh, those funds to you know, vet the money managers, make sure they uh, are appropriate for that particular portfolio. And if they both agree, then ultimately they'll invest in uh, with those money managers into the portfolio that you have chosen. 
they continually look at those portfolios to ensure that um, they're meeting the needs of the trust, that they're uh, reaching the uh, returns that you're expected, that the risk is uh, minimized as much as possible so that you have the best um, possible investment for what you're looking to do to accomplish. Okay, thank you, because I was just looking like with the portfolio returns, some of them are real favorable as opposed to what you can walk into a bank or get a CD or whatever. So I, I was kind of impressed with that. Certainly, as you get uh, have more equities, you do have a larger return. There's a little bit more risk, so that's where you know identifing what your appropriate risk level is is appropriate. Right. Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. And I think this is one of the pages you were probably referring to, yeah. Carla. Yes. Okay. I have that page back. Thanks. Any other questions? All right. Um, I will open it up for public comment. Is there any member of the public who would like to speak to this? Hi, Carl Spurs. Hi. 73 Lakeside Drive. I was just talking to Nick a little bit. I, I agree with Jim. I think 30 basis points to run this is pretty efficient. Um, but I'm kind of interested in what is the total fee? What's the weighted expense ratio plus that? Are there any trust fees involved? So when I was asking Nick, put a summary table together of all the fees, because this just shows you the uh, expense ratios, but it's going to be different. Some are quite expensive to run. Um, so entry, interested in kind of a summary table of, of the fees the county's actually going to pay in total. That's what I'm curious about. But it looks good. Thank you. Carl? Yeah. Basically what you're saying is take a weighted average of the expense ratios of all the mutual funds? Yeah, whatever the portfolio they decide to choose. Okay. Look at a weighted average in there. Um, okay. Because, you know, ETFs, as you know, are extremely cheap to run. Right. Um, I mean, trading costs, I don't know what the turnover of the portfolio would be, probably pretty pretty minimal. I'm not sure you'd be so. doing a lot of, you know, reallocation much. But, um, but you know, there's some 1% plus expense ratio funds in there. Yep. They tend to be a little more high octane. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and also the returns here, we've been, we're in the ninth year of a bull market. Any five, ten year return is going to look fabulous. I think that party's kind of coming to an end. So my encouragement would be settle things down a bit, be a little more conservative, and probably more international. Jim might agree with me on that. <laughs> but anyway, it, it looks good, but I'm just, I'm, I'm worried about next year. But I'd be interested in the total cost, what you guys are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other member of the public who would like to speak to this? See none, I will bring it back. Jim, would you be able to uh, take Carl's comment and frame it into the proper question to get Nick to maybe respond to what the fees, the total fees are? Because my understanding was the 30 basis point was it, and that any of these returns were after the actual fund costs, correct? Comment on that. Okay. Um, that is true. So all the returns you are seeing are net of any of the investment fees from the money managers. The only fees that we do charge are the 30 basis points for each firm um, in the management of the trust itself. There are no additional fees, no transaction fees, there's no withdrawal fees, no 12B1 fees, or any other such fees, transaction fees uh, for this trust. So um, the only thing that uh, is being charged to your account would be for the administration of the trust, which is the 30 bips there. But if we were to try and sort of drill down and get the total cost, a weighted average of these mutual funds in a given portfolio, mm -hmm. plus the 30 basis points would give us a good guesstimate of the all-in costs. Exactly. So um, on one of the summary pages, it's up either one or two slides from this right here, you'll see right above the uh, dark line at the bottom, there is uh, fourth column over expenses. Yes, and then here, this is the total expense ratio for each of the portfolios. So okay. if you're in um, aggressive growth, moderate growth, that's the third one over, which you were speaking about originally, uh, it's 0.76%, 76 bips um, for all the money managers, the investment fees for that um, 
again, there are no other transaction fees. So the return on that particular portfolio would be an additional just 30 bips, which is um, 10 uh, basis points for both for Morgan Stanley, Benefit Trust, and Keenan. And so then that investment ratio can change briefly depending on what uh, money managers are being included. So should uh, Morgan Stanley and Benefit Trust Company feel that you get a better return, lower risk on a different money manager, then that would change slightly. So you can say at the moment, yeah, that's what it looks like. That's ballpark. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK. Any other questions? Furrowed brow down there, Bob. Uh, no, I'm just wondering. Um, how often is the investment strategy reviewed? We can determine that. So by the board, any and how often does the board meet? With the well, board meets once things. a year. Okay, once a year. But right now, but the, the board, the the, the 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 town council mm -hmm. could say we're going to do moderate, mm -hmm. and then in three months say, hey, wait a minute, we don't like that, we want to go with aggressive. And then this, uh, the town staff could say, shift, uh, shift our portfolio from the uh, moderate growth to the very aggressive growth. And they would reconfigure the port our portfolio that way. And then we could tell them, no, we're scared. We want to go back to uh, very conservative. Uh, my advice is don't do that because there's sort of If enough people do that in a portfolio, then it causes problems. I, I, no, no, no. I, I, I agree with you completely. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I think yeah. we're not in the business of market timing, right? And we shouldn't so, be yeah. <laughs> trying to anticipate yeah. what the market is yeah. doing. And and my and the reason I'm asking the question is just I want to encourage us to look at the most conservative outlook we can for these funds. These are government funds. We should be more conservative versus aggressive. And to the point Carl just made, I do, I do feel like we just. It, you know, we've had a nine-year party in the stock market, and I think it's getting close to midnight. So we should just, you know, take that into consideration as well. And, and I would just encourage us to be more conservative versus less conservative with yeah. this. Okay. Mike, I, you know, I hear Carl, and the problem is, is if we go more conservative, we're going more into fixed income. And I don't see how yields can get much lower than they are, even though I do know <laughs> Japan, it's negative, Europe, it's negative. Right. Uh, but right. one of these days, basically, as soon as the central banks turn off the uh, fire hose, right. uh, yield, yields, I would expect to return something close to normal. Mm -hmm. And so then you would have immediate loss. And if you're in fixed income, you can't gr really grow out of a loss. Right. Uh, but, but equity, you can suddenly have a 50, per, 50, 60 percent loss over a short period of time. So I'm sort of conservative. To, okay. I, I think I, I, I wanted to I, respond anyway. to what you had originally sure. said, Bob, and that is and something we discussed um, when we met with the um, with the consultants. Um, we as a town can change our investment strategy anytime we want with no penalty. And as soon as they get the order, the direction from the town, they make the change. So same day or the next day, depending on the timing. Um, so we are not locked into any one investment strategy for any extended period of time. We can change anytime we want. Okay. Um, so I'm going to ask one more time, is there anybody else who, from the audience who has not spoken? on this agenda item who would like to? Okay, see now closing public comment. Let's bring it back for discussion. We've got multiple um, items here. So uh, do we want to maybe just um, get some overall brief comments about whether or not you support this strategy and, and what your thoughts are, and then we'll move forward from there? Um, because if we don't have the votes, it's not get into the weeds too much. Any sure. thoughts? I think this is <clears throat> a great idea. I think you guys have done a terrific job on it. I thank Diane and Jim for all the work you've done on this. 
I absolutely trust you guys completely on anything having to do with financial matters and pensions. And if you guys have vetted this, and I think staff has as well, I'm all for it, and I'd say go for it. Thank you. Jim? Uh, since I worked on it, I, you know, I accept uh, responsibility for it. One thing I would like... But it's all on your shoulders, Jim. <laughs> I know. Uh, What's your phone number? <laughs> Uh, one thing I would like to, uh, folks, when when you hear a section 115, uh, it's not, that's nothing mysterious. It's just a part of the Internal Re uh, Revenue Code that lets us set up a pension plan. It's like somebody says a Trust, four, yeah. uh, you know, a 401k. That's just a subsection of a subsection of the code. So, you know, section 115 trust is in very, you know. Don't treat it as mysterious. In terms of the costs, I think it's reasonable and as efficient as we could do. Uh, the fact that they're using mutual funds does give us more liquidity because a mutual fund, you know, if you send them a, a redemption order and they get it before one o'clock Pacific. They are, they're expected to send you the money the next day. And legally, after f five days, the SEC's after you if you have not sent them the money. So in terms of ability to shift from one thing to another, this is very liquid, the way it's been structured. Uh, and the co overall costs are reasonable given the nature of what they're working on. So, Thank you. Down here, Carla? I, th I think it looks really good. I think that um, we have a lot of safe options. And uh, I want to thank you, Diane and Jim, for, for doing this. I know you put a tremendous amount of work. And Daria, thank you very much. Thank you. Sloan? Yeah, no, it seems like good work all around. Um, of the five items under the staff recommendation, the only one that it's not clear we have an accord on is, if I'm understanding this correctly, is number four says that council designate, this is a recommendation, an investment strategy for the Pension Stabilization Trust. Um, is it, I, ta I, I'm, <clears throat> I take it that an investment strategy is the same thing as saying which portfolio we'd want. Rebecca? Mm -hmm. I don't feel like we have a, headline. a perfect accord on what that strategy should be, but I'm 100% with setting it up otherwise. Well, let me just throw an idea out, and we'll get to that in a minute when we move through. The council can designate as the investment strategy that the town manager, the director of finance, okay. and the finance ad hoc committee of the council decide it. That sounds great. I Within certain take, parameters, uh, like you probably as a council want to say, don't do the super aggressive one. We don't want that. Okay. Maybe not even the, the two most aggressive, which are, you know, if you look at this one, it's the aggressive growth and the growth. Maybe we want, we want to keep it somewhere between conservative and moderate growth as a council policy. But we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Okay. That was the only. Otherwise, I'm ready to make a motion. Okay. There's something else. Well, hold on. I'd I get my time to say a few things. One way to. You need a microphone, Jim. I'm sorry. One way to look at these different strategies is just look at the percentage of equities versus, if you scrolled up, uh, you know this is conservative 16% equities, which means. The balance, 84%, is in fixed incomes. So it's sort of like, you know, do you want to lean heavily to, towards fixed income? <coughs> towards Microphone, equity? Jim. Do you want to lean, lean heavily towards equities, heavily towards fixed income? Uh, the moderate growth is lower, you know, significantly lower than what CalPERS, which is, I believe, 50-50, and they're going higher. Uh, then, you know, w with a greater weighting on equity, and we're sort of going the other way with sort of underweighting equ equities. So, yeah. so bef before you leave, can you once again point to the line that says total equities? Uh, up here. Yeah. Here we go. Total equities is there, and it gives the percent, and then total bonds. 
So the percent should add up to 100%, and each of the different columns represents the different investment strategies. So story. this is also in your packet. Um, it doesn't have a page number, but um, for instance, the most aggressive has 76% equities, 24% bonds, whereas conservative investment strategy has 16% equities, meaning stocks, and 84% bonds. Fixed income, you'll notice, has zero equities, 100% in bonds. Diane, I'm so very content to have you and Jim work this out. Okay. <laughs> Are you saying we're nerds? No, I just am. Um, I'm, I'm with you. That's All right. <laughs> okay. I have a few things to share. Um, first of all, I'm really excited that Corte Madera is going to be the first member of this Board of Authority. This is in the state of California um, for small towns taking advantage of this opportunity to invest in a 115 trust. And the reason why this is so important is because we anticipate, obviously, as Daria explained, that CalPERS will eventually get to a 6% discount rate, but it will take them a very long time to get there. And that means that if we do nothing, it's going to cost us a lot more in the long, long run. So this is a way for us to save money, put money away now to help meet some of those unfunded liabilities later. The 115 is going to allow us the flexibility to invest what we can when we can. If we hit another economic downturn and we can't, we, we find that we, ha we struggle in a particular fiscal year and we can't make a significant contribution, it's okay. Um, but we have some money banked. Uh, when CalPERS does eventually increase the amounts that they're going to require us to put in, we can start drawing from the 115 to help make up that difference so that hopefully this town never gets to the point where we're paying 60 percent of our payroll to CalPERS for these unfunded amounts. Um, so this is a way for us to get on top of our, our liability now and not kick it down the road for future generations. So um, we have multiple um, uh, motions that we need to take. The first one would be to approve the attached resolution number 64-2017 adoption of a section 115 pension stabilization trust administered by Keenan so moved second call the vote please councilmember andrews yes councilmember bailey yes councilmember ravazio yes vice mayor condon yes mayor first yes next we need to approve the town joining the california public entities board of authority so now moved. um That is not a separate resolution, correct? Are we directing you to sign, or what specifically is this um, this one about? I want to make sure I get this correct. We're on item two or three. Two. Item two, yes. So this would be given the uh, the authority for the town manager to sign the agreement and for the town to enter to okay. join the board. So we're approving the town manager to sign to join the California Public Entities Board of Authority, a multi-employer trust. So moved. Second. Thank you. Call the vote, please. Councilmember Andrews. Yes. Councilmember Bailey. Yes. Councilmember Ravazio. Yes. Vice Mayor Condon. Yes. Mayor First. Yes. Thank you. We need to appoint town staff as a representative and an alternate to the Board of Authority. Um, in your packet, there, um, did you? I think that was covered under. Do you even have that in here? Did I see that in here? Isn't that covered in 64? 
2017 item four. Is it or item three? Thank you, it is, but let's do it officially on your agenda item. Um, right. So the original resolution appoints the town manager as the member representing the town on the board of authority and appoints the finance director as the alternate. Um, but you wanted a separate vote on this under um, number three, correct, Teresa? Um, it, it's, in, it's in the it's resolution. In the resolution mm -hmm. But do you want us to make a separate appointment that uh, corresponds with what is in the resolution? I, I think you've done it, but if for clarity you'd like to take a motion to reconfirm that, that is fine. Mm -hmm. For clarity, let's just take a vote, folks, please. Is there a motion? Sure, sure, so moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Councilmember Anders. Yes. Councilmember Raley. Yes. Councilmember Ravazio. Yes. Vice Mayor Condon. Yes. Mayor First. Yes. Uh, okay. Number four. four. Yes. Designate an <clears throat> investment strategy for the Section 115. So. Yeah, I'll move that we designate investment strategy by delegating that authority to uh, um, uh, Jim and Diane and Todd. Um, Is that right? Is there somebody else on the committee? Daria. Yeah. Daria. Yes, of course. I, is that yeah. okay with you? Yes. Okay, I'll second that. Right. Okay. Would you like to amend that by limiting? The reason I'm asking this is because let's say seven years from now, none of us are on the council anymore. All right, let's say 12 years from now. None of us are on the council anymore. And who knows who's sitting up here, and they all of a sudden want to go aggressive growth with our 115. Do we really want that? Okay. I will amend it to um, request that they uh, give due consideration to excluding either the fixed income or the aggressive growth from their choices. What do you think, Jim? Yeah, that'd work. Should we eliminate fixed income? No. Yeah. That's the most conservative. That's I thought the idea is to just cut off the peaks and the valleys, right? So we get something more in the median, no? Well, but, okay, let's think 20 years out. What if uh, interest rates go way up and fixed income becomes a really... Not, o not only that, color. but 20 years out, uh, CalPERS has gotten their discount rate to match our 6% discount rate. So we really can't afford fluctuations in present in uh, the net asset value of the portfolio. So we would probably want to gradually get more conservative as we're liquidating the 150. So you mean just, I just, so the, the two to eliminate would be the top two, the growth and the aggressive growth and pick amongst moderate through fixed income. He or at least eliminate aggressive growth. Yeah, or just to uh, eliminate. Aggr aggressive is, you know. That's the riskiest. Yeah. Just, just okay, so I, uh, so I'll amend the motion so that we uh, delegate the authority to select amongst the different portfolio strategies. Um, although I, <laughs> I'm, I'm detecting consternation amongst our town attorney and town manager and wonder if we ought to wait until they reach consensus before we <laughs> make a vote. I agree with you. <laughs> so I just want to make sure I understand the motion. Yes. So you're delegating essentially to your finance committee to work with your town manager and your um, finance director to make a determination. Does that sound appropriate? Um, I want to... <laughs> I think if you have some restrictions on that delegation, you should um, you should give that. You could also ask that it be reported back to you so that you're aware of what decision was made, and that would then give you the ability to um, make a different decision if you then wanted to. Um, okay. in, in terms of um, restricting a future council, however, that. Um, this council can't bind a future council, and so a future council could come and decide to eliminate the delegation of authority to the Finance Committee um, in the future. So even if you make a decision to eliminate peaks and valleys, 
today, that decision could be revisited by a future council or, frankly, this council. I mean, how about if instead of limiting the direction, the limitation is instead to come back and report to the full council or something, right? Is that what you're saying? Uh, well, I, I think we recognize that any future council can undo what we do. I mean, let's face it, we don't get to decide things. Right, in perpetuity. Forever, in perpetuity. But the direction of this full council to the finance ad hoc, the town manager and the finance director can be you f a majority of you four can decide the strategy between fixed income and growth. But we as a council, full council, are not delegating to the majority of the four of you the ability to choose aggressive growth. If we ever want to change and do aggressive growth, it will take a majority of the council. I was under the impression that we could never delegate our authority to people who are not on the council. But maybe we can. But we are allowing them to pick one of these investment strategies, because we need some flexibility there, I think. The council only meets twice a month. And considering what's going on in the market, it, it, there may be a situation where we all of a sudden want to go a little bit more conservative. That's why we were at one point talking about having the finance ad hoc, the town manager, and the finance director be able to determine um, Diane, I'm good with the strategy. whole thing. I'm trying to figure out how do we state this in a way that provides peace and confidence to you. Yeah, I'm wondering, though, as we talk this out a little bit, um, there would be an awkwardness if we had a 3-1 vote and if that one was one of the council members <laughs> on the. So I'm just, so how maybe, you know, council sets policy. This is a policy decision. How I'd see it is you're delegating the investment strategy to your finance committee, the two council members, and they will work with staff the manager and the finance director. If we ever have, if our council members are ever split, we would take that decision back to the council for an overall vote, uh, but we will always give updates to the council, period. That's by practice. And that's how I would see it work, and so that would be my recommendation. Delegate the authority to the two, um, okay. to your finance committee. Pretty sure with, that's where I started. With a report back <laughs> at the next council meeting. Yeah, absolutely. Of any yes. change. Yeah. That sounds that good. Sure. Does somebody want to state it? All right. Move it? <laughs> so, do you want to say it one more time or you want me to? Uh, I would say uh, delegate the authority uh, to the Finance Committee to work uh, closely with the town manager and the finance director on setting, um, on setting our investment strategy. All right. So moved. Do we want to then, though, exclude aggressive growth as an option? I think it makes sense. I would be comfortable with that. Uh, you, you know, you two are the two on the committee, for Christ's sake. I know. Uh, I'm trying to protect okay. it for in the future okay, right. so that it would have to be a full council decision if anybody ever wanted to go to the aggressive growth. Right. I'm trying to future-proof it okay. a little bit. Yeah. Make it harder. Okay. Yeah, I want to make crazy. it more difficult for somebody to go aggressive growth. Okay, so so we'll uh, move that we delegate the authority to you two um, in consultation with others, but you two have the authority um, with the express limitation not to select aggressive growth. Great. Second. And we will work with the town manager and the finance director. I'll second that. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Councilmember Andrews? Yes. Councilmember Bailey? Yes. Councilmember Ravazio? Yes. Vice Mayor Condon? Yes. Mayor First? Yes. Thank you. And that finally, um, we approve a transfer of $366,000 into the Section 115 Pension Stabilization Trust. And I just, for the benefit of uh, the members of the public that are here and or watching from home, that is the amount, as Daria explained earlier, that we have been paying to CalPERS for many years when they um, pooled us with other small entities and charged us this enormous amount called a side fund that we paid off over several years. We have paid off that side fund. I believe that was for the miscellaneous. That was for safety. So our, our fire and police, well, mostly fire. Um, 
since we are accustomed to paying that out to CalPERS every year, we just figured we'd keep paying that out, but we'd now pay it into our trust. So that is our contribution um, that we anticipate we'll be making annually. So who wants to approve the transfer of 366000 So move for the approval. Second. Councilmember Andrews. Yes. Councilmember Bailey. Yes. Councilmember Ravazio. Yes. Vice Mayor Condon. Yes. Mayor First. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for coming out, Nick. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thank you, Daria, for all your work on that too. And you, and Todd, you also. Um, all righty. Let's move on to agenda item 6.4, discussion and possible direction to staff regarding uh, architectural plans for potential renovations to the community center, um, having to do with the um, inter, uh, future intergenerational center. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. This is a follow-up to the November 7, 2017 town council meeting regarding the intergenerational center presentation by our very own Vice Mayor Carla Condon. Um, council uh, directed staff to come back with an architectural plan and a, a potential budget for this uh, potential project. Um, and so up on the TV and within the staff report, you have the architectures, ar architects' uh, initial plans uh, regarding those renovations per our meeting um, the other night. Um, and staff is requesting council consider uh, the following. Number one, review the plans regarding the potential renovations of the community center. Um, and direct staff accordingly, just to make sure that we're on track on what we're thinking. Uh, two, authorize the town manager to continue uh, with this recommended plan or make any changes as necessary. And three, to authorize the town manager to proceed with a supplemental budget appropriation up to $160,000. And the fiscal impact on the bottom of page one and two, um, I gave you a summary breakdown. They are conservative numbers. Uh, I believe uh, that we can uh, lower these costs, but I wanted to be uh, conservative in our approach. Um, and so what I'm asking uh, is for consideration of a supplemental budget appropriation on this project up to $160,000. Um, being that dollar amount, we will have to do uh, a bid package and bid this process. Uh, and we would ultimately come back to council uh, with those with that process and any uh, bids in the future. And so I did want to point that out to you. Peter's here as well to answer any questions uh, regarding the design uh, and the process. Um, and I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions that you may have. Thank you. Jim. What is Mar Marlowe Oh, Marmolium? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Marmoleum is um, a type of linoleum. It's a very heavy duty one, and it comes in some really beautiful patterns. Okay. But it's uh, used for commercial high use, and it also um, was just going to be used um, in part of the entry and in the um, area that would be somewhat restricted to um, really young kids. Um, because you won't slip on it. Okay, good. And so it's a safety feature as well as very durable. All right, good. I was concerned about folks slipping. Yeah, and this is expressly to prevent that. All right. Um, I have a question about the estimate of the 166. Yes. Um, so in my own line of work, we have noticed over the last handful of months that uh, materials and other construction prices are going up dramatically. 40 percent, 100 percent, I mean, extraordinary increases. So when, when you come up with the number of 160, are you factoring in the recent scarcity as a consequence of the North Coast fires and so forth or what? Yeah, so we, um, on this process, we actually, through our architect and a contractor that worked closely with us, actually gave us, uh, provided us with those estimates. Okay, and this is post, this, this is, is with a, an eye towards the fact that we can see there's a scarcity right now. Yeah, this was in the last uh, two weeks. Okay. Kate had an evaluation and knowing that we want to do the project over the next four months. Great, good enough. Thank you. Anybody else? Nope. Jim. Okay. If uh, you said we're setting it. Uh, setting it out the bid, Th this contract would probably be one of the bidders. 
Well, it's a good question, Councilmember Andrew. So originally we were hoping to be in a certain number where we wouldn't have to necessarily go to bid. And we know that number is higher, so we're going to have to, and so I hope so. Okay. Uh, but I don't know. It comes to the scheduling uh, part of what uh, Councilmember uh, Bailey asked. It, I hope so. Yeah, but I can't say for sure. Uh, if we were to s send it out the bid, would the contractor still be able to start and get it done within the time frame you're hoping for? Yes, that's our okay. hope. I mean, that's time is on our is uh, is of the essence, uh, and that's why we took this uh, to the council uh, before the holiday, okay. because every every day is going to count at this point with that schedule. So the quicker we can move, uh, the more successful we'll be with that schedule. In bad weather, winter is better for interior work. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, that, and that's a, another really good point. Uh, thank you. Yes, this is entirely interior, and that will help us through the. The rainy season, yes. Okay. But we got to get moving. We have to get yeah. moving. How can I ask you how fast we can get so, this moving? So I'll, I'm going to defer that to Peter. <coughs> uh, Madam Mayor and Councilmember Conrad, I think what we can do um, is, given your direction, first first of the year we'll be back on on January second, and uh, I can have my staff uh, use what we already have in terms of estimates and put it into a bid package. I imagine we could post it uh, within a week or two in January. Um, you know, with the typical uh, you know time frame for for leaving it open, we have some flexibility in that. Uh, but I think that just so that you're all aware, it is going to slow down a little bit as we go to open bid. Um, so uh, you know, we understand that it's a priority, but I just wanted to caution you all that uh, it may take a little longer than you had originally originally hoped. Um, any chance we could have the results by the uh, February meeting, which is second Tuesday or third Tuesday of January? Yeah, you know, I think late February we could come back to council. It would be a little tough to do it in early February, but we can certainly uh, take that direction and, and try to come back to you at that point. Okay. The bid process is usually when you do it up at four to six weeks. So when you okay. look at that, and that's what set us back on our schedule. We were hoping if we were successful and we moved expeditedly and we didn't have to, I don't even know, Word is expeditedly. See, it's I know what you mean. Expeditiously. Sorry. See, yeah, strategic. Um, <laughs> we were hoping to have this uh, completed at the end of February, so March 1st open. And now, when I look at the schedule, it just pushed us back six weeks, and you know, and possibly the holiday, as Peter brought up. And so that's our that's our delay. Okay. That's our range. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Good enough. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? All right. I've got a few questions. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk about how the classrooms would be used. Um, I'm concerned about maximum flexibility for programming uh, classroom space and, and having some lounge space. There's a proposal for a kitchen all the way on the south end. I'm concerned that maybe that's not the best spot. I'm also concerned about that we have enough space for staff. So h how do we anticipate that these rooms would be used? Can, can I address that or did you want to, Peter? Uh, do you want me to give a basic overview? Of, sure. Of, of, sure. So uh, uh, the vice mayor will talk about programming and what, what the plan is because she's really taking the leadership role on that. As you know right now, this is a current, this is when you walk in to the front doors of the community center, come in and you start to go into the offices. And this, 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 uh, this room is already here. This is, we already have this. One of the things we were looking at doing, uh, we have a kitchenette down on the employee side here. There's a little kitchenette and we were contemplating, sorry, moving back over here, <laughs> back and forth, back and forth. We were contemplating moving, uh, cutting into store, the storage area and making a kitchenette uh, in this area. And I'll, again, I'll, I'll have the vice mayor speak to programming. These are removable walls, right? And so you, you can have a small classroom or then a 16 by 16 approximately, or you could have a 32 by 16 room. This is also collapsible. All of these doors, so you have, you have basically three walls and all of them are collapsible if necessary. So adding us a lot of flexibility on having um, big presentations or specific uh, types of um, programming. Um, come down here. Uh, again, this is the this is the open area. This is where staff, as we start to move staff staff from the uh, south to the north, um, 
This is Mario's uh, current office. Again, this is the kitchenette, so we were gonna take this down and remove this area and add extra space. Our staff is working in this area, and also we're moving some staff uh, to the front of uh, the reception area. Again, we have two full-time employees, that's Mario and Brian, and then we have our part-time employees. So we have a number of flexibility options of where we're gonna move staff. Um, and so that's the overview of, of what we're looking at. Again, we're, doing, we're not doing major construction work, we're actually adding some temporary removable types of walls. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the Vice Mayor and she can talk about uh, programming and the use of the facility. Okay, if we go to, back to the left, um, where that kitchenette is, um, the reason it's there rather than somewhere else is because that was the cheapest place to do it with the, the connections. Everything that we're doing is to do it at the minimal cost but get the biggest bang for our buck on it. Um, then also what doesn't show is beyond that, Mario was willing to give up a little of that storage space which will uh, provide for storage. The room that is by the kitchenette is the room that the floor is linoleum and for um, programs that involve little ones who might be doing art projects or whatever, they have the linoleum floor, the marmoleum floor, um, that's easy to clean. Um, also, if, then if you go to the next room, that is the reception room. And that is where um, staff or a volunteer will be there to oversee the goings on of the intergenerational center. Um, they'll also, it'll be like a welcoming place and there'll be a desk set up there. <coughs> Between the children's room and on either side of the reception room, um, there'll be soundproofing accordion doors so that we can either expand the rooms or um, compact them and still have pretty good um, sound quality because we propose to drop the ceiling so that all the ducts that are exposed and all the pink cotton candy that's wrapped around the ducts, that, um, that that is gone and that also we will change the duct systems um, so that it isn't, we're gonna improve them so it isn't um, blowing in people's faces. Um, so there'll be the soundproofing between the rooms and the, the furniture in the uh, reception area, the desk that's there, um, will be on casters so that it's easily moved if we need to borrow from the reception room. Um, then going on to uh, room B there, um, that we're thinking about having um, that perhaps as a senior card room, for example, or a game room, um, a meeting place, uh, something that people can use if it's not being used for a classroom. All these rooms are very flexible as far as their, youth, their use. Then on the last space, on room C, um, where that, uh, the walls will be removed, as Todd mentioned, that will be the biggest room um, that can be closed off. And on that, um, we envision seeing programs like chair yoga or um, lecture groups, book <coughs> clubs, various um, activities that are going to be available um, would be in that room. And there would be um, provisions for seating as well as tables, all very flexible. Then in what's Mario's in the Office D, um, what we're eventually proposing, or what we propose, but we are going to loan it out to uh, uh, part of Park and Rec staff, is that we will have um, an age-friendly desk there, um, either there or in the reception area, but there, but also um, there has been interest in 
having um, wellness checks where somebody comes in to check people's blood pressure once a week. Um, it could be where uh, counselors who might work at Redwood uh, might perhaps come down there and once a week meet with Redwood students there. Um, also, it had been recommended to us by Marin Space that there is a market to actually rent a desk or two um, to nonprofits in the county that want um, a Southern <coughs> Marin presence to be able to um, to provide information or counseling um, in those spaces. And they would rent those spaces and then it would become a revenue generating um, use that would help to defray other costs. Um, what else can I tell you? Oh, and that one would have its, its own separate entrance. You'll notice that that um, they have a separate entrances so that um, if people want to go into that uh, private office at the far right, they have their own door from the exterior. The same goes for in room C. If there's a big event, rather than walking through room B where there's already something going on, they can just enter through there. So we've given a lot of flexibility and multi-uses, um, both the way it's spaced and in the furniture that's been specced out. And yes, Jim. Uh, let me see. Above Office D, there's sort of two rooms. What are they going to be used for? Wait. Oh, there? Um, one of them is... Um, where all the wires and stuff are. Yeah, the, okay. the first the one network. above, yeah, is the IT computer room, and the second one is actually storage uh, okay. from the stage. If I may, uh, <clears throat> Madam Mayor and, and Council Members, I just wanted to remind you all that if, if what we said is true and we're going back out to open bid, then we don't have to worry too much about the details. I think one of my staff's tasks will be to translate these concepts, flexible use of space, um, designs that we're looking for, material uses, we can put that kind of stuff in the bid package. But my experience over the last 10 years of working with architects is they're more creative than public work staff, maybe even more creative than town managers. Um, I'd like to leave it open to the folks that are interested in bidding on this project to help us, uh, you know, uh, come up with concepts. It may very well be the, the plans very similar to what you have, ha what we have in front of us. It may be something slightly different. So um, my suggestion would be to translate a lot of these ideas and concepts um, uh, into what we're looking for in the outcome, but to really um, maybe have this discussion in, in late February, early March when we have selected a, a, a designer uh, and we can really give them direction probably a little bit better at that time. Okay. Well, I will mention, Peter, that we thought this was going to start. And Understood. So we've already Understood. lined up. Okay all our accoutrements for, you know, for there. Understood. And, and, and I hear that, and I know a lot of work has gone into that, and I think we can preserve that. Um, I think what I'm trying to uh, get across is that turning a lot of these detailed designs into concepts and outcomes, we could still come back to this. This may very well be what we're, where we end up. Uh, but I do think that it's not going to be that open of a bid if it's really constricted on what, what it has to be including, Is that, if that makes any sense. Yeah, well, I was just going to say that the design of what's, what was to be provided in there has been pretty much selected. Okay, well, I have some real concerns about the design. So at some point, we're going to need to have a discussion about this. For instance, if you look at room B, that's only 12 and a half feet wide. That's pretty small, and I don't see how you're going to be able to fit much furniture in there for a program. It's so I. Yeah, it's it would that was the senior little meet and greet where they might have a couple of card tables set up for um, you know to play cards or board games or that type of thing. The main 
the main meeting room is room C, which is quite a bit bigger that can be expanded into B. Okay, but that's where staff is going to be. I, you know, when we discuss no. this, no, no. no. where's staff going to be? Staff's in D. Staff so is we're going to have left. two staff members in D. Todd? No. We're not going to have any staff in C. So I think the vice mayor ultimately, and by the vice mayor could speak for herself. I think ultimately they would like to see this whole wing available to the intergenerational center. And I think as we go and we start to program and we have successes, I think we're, we we have to do this in multiple steps. And, and I think and I and I think as we start to talk, it's pretty exciting of what's the work that's being done. And I think we're going to get there. Staff uh, uh, initially, I mean, we're we're going to have to we're going to have to talk about this. But you look at room C and office D. That's where staff is, and um, if we're very successful in programming, and then we, we have some op options of where we can put staff and split them between Office D and up front, and we have some options. And so working with Mario and his team, that's what we're going through right now of phases. Hey, how quickly, if we're very successful, what can we do? What are our options? And I think I, I see February now as a potential opportunity to share that with council and because there's cost to that obviously right so um, but yes I, you, we have at any given time four employees working in that area two part-time two full-time um, and so we're looking at that yeah. oh that's you know what darn that's temporary for our for Corte Madera's staff mm -hmm. that's temporary because they will then have another space. We don't have another space for them. So if we're going to talk about moving them to another space, that's an additional cost that we need to kind of keep in the back of our minds that right. we're and talking I think about that's, building another building. Yeah, and I think that's Okay, because, I, I mean, I love this project. I want to see it move forward. But my understanding is that we were going to create classrooms that could be used for programs while we also can accommodate staff and prove that there's enough interest in the community for these kinds of programs then we can expand it but we can't just jump into this with assumptions that we're going to be able to fund a brand new building for staff i think we've got to start with figuring out what how we can use this space to provide the beginnings of the intergenerational center while still keeping staff here and then if it proves to be the big the big success we are all assuming hoping and assuming it will be then we start talking about whether or not we want to relocate staff um, but let me just make a couple of of observations that um, that I've come up with that maybe can solve some of this. Um, if room B can be made a little bit larger, and then if we take out the wall in Office D, um, which was the concept that I had originally come up, came up with that we we discussed at the last council meeting when this this was on the agenda. Um, that will give you a much larger room B. I think you can get another probably three feet for room B, which will really give you, I think, some more flexibility. And you get that door to the main hall. Now that would require creating a new doorway from room C, you know, somewhere a little bit north of where that existing door is. Um, alternatively, Maybe you blow out the entire room C and office D space and make that one big area and we move staff to room A. If, but if we're going to do something like that, I think it makes sense with the kids' programs to have a sink. So anyway, I'm just putting that out there as a challenge. But I would like to see us move forward with the assumption that staff is going to be here for the time being with no firm plans yet to build a new building to house staff. I, I think that's a, a leap 
we're not ready to make tonight without a little bit more information about the the community's interest in the programs that we're anticipating um, to have in this space. Uh, my other concern is with the doorways, not necessarily the doorway to the reception area, but the doorway to room C and then the doorway to room D, and I'm talking about the exterior doorways. I'd like to make sure that those are ADA. Um, even if they are ADA, um, I think we should make sure that the pathways leading up to them are wide enough, not only to meet ADA, but to be comfortable um, for, you know, folks with, with walkers and wheelchairs, strollers, all the different types of users. Um, are there any other questions at this point? So, uh, Jim. Yeah. Uh, what I th thought I heard you describe is, in effect, a data closet. Uh, mm -hmm. My advice would be you currently have one door on the s south side. At right angles to it, put another door because I have found in terms of office build outs, if you have one door to a data closet, you have to have a bigger closet because folks need to get in to uh, get in the back racks. But if you have two doors right next to each other, you can have a door open here, a rack. You open the other door here, you got the back of the rack. And you can get a lot more stuff crammed into one small closet. Also, uh, I don't know what sort of doors you're going to put on there, but you might need to think about louvers so you can get uh, air circulation through it, unless you're going to actually build in uh, uh, fans to cool equipment. But then again, I don't, I'm not certain what sort of equipment you'll be putting in there. But Well, it's existing. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Let's open it up to public comment. Any member of the public like to speak to this? <laughs> well, maybe. Okay. Patty Stolyer, co-chair of Age Friendly Corte Madeira and vice president or something of Age Friendly Solutions. Um, <laughs> Of course, I'm thrilled that we're moving ahead with this, and I really, really uh, am grateful for the support of the town council, who unanimously um, wanted us to move forward with it. I do think there are ways that we can work with the staff that's there to find spaces so that everybody can play together. Um, and one thing that Carla didn't point out was about the teen concept, and we want to have a place, we want it to be a hangout for anybody of any age. So um, one thing that we heard from the uh, senior coordinator at the rec department was that after the lunch is done, they have to skedaddle because the hall is being used for something else, and they're not done talking. They want to come somewhere where they can just roost and finish their conversation, and so that's perfect for that area that's small or the reception area uh, in, in the front doorway. And um, the other idea that we feel strongly about is, uh, and we were just talking about it at our intergenerational task force meeting, uh, an app class or an app uh, study hall where Redwood students could come and help you with your iPad, your phone, whatever, and where it's you know their first language. This is a challenge for a lot of people that are older, and it's a perfect bonding thing for the intergeneration. And um, the same thing with the little kids, that we see it as an opportunity to have um, uh, some kind of song and dance or something where at least the seniors might watch and be entertained by the little kids or participate with the little kids. So we see the whole thing as being intergenerational, not multi-generational, but intergenerational. And um, one of the things we're going to pull people tomorrow at the um, third Wednesday um, um, reception for the holidays is if they want to mentor just uh, seniors, if they want to 
be an instructor for intergenerational, or maybe they want to be instructor just for little kids. So we're trying to find out what people's interested are interested in in terms of volunteering to be a, a leader or whatever, and to get information of what they'd like to see at the senior at the intergenerational center. So thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak to this? See none, I will close public comment and bring it back for discussion. Oh. Um, just one comment I'd like to make, but then I want to hear from everybody else, is that um, today, Patty and I met with um, Stephanie Moulton-Peters from Mill Valley and Kate Sears' um, assistant, uh, Maureen Parton, and uh, Lee Poland from the county and two of the staff members from Mill Valley because they w are interested in becoming an age-friendly city. And um, Lee Poland said that we were eligible to apply and he would have a check for us for $5,000 towards this project. And um, people are just are very, very excited about it, and it will be the first in the county. All right. Anybody else? Sloan? I mean, the only comment I'd have is I think Peter has a right of it. We should not be too restrictive on the design of the thing and let the, the pros who are being paid see if they can't come up with something better. Well, I know what you mean. I just so that you know that how we have the bid and the architect, mm -hmm. it wasn't until what we did. We were in the right ballpark for um, uh, getting it approved, but um, the architect and the contractor both posed options that would make the space even better in the long run. Um, that it would be uh, more environmentally appropriate, that it would be greener, um, that it would be more serviceable, and that's what raised the, the price to what we're doing. So they, they were ready to go. Down here. Bob? Um, <clears throat> I concur with Sloan. I'm all for it. I think, I, as I said at the last meeting, I think this is a great idea. I'm thrilled that we're doing it. and. Um, we should just allow staff, you know, the way these the way these kind of projects work is you have to give people a little wiggle room as they're working through it to figure out what the best the best way to do things are because they're going to figure out ways that are better and also probably more efficient. Good. I agree. All I would suggest is when you sort of have a concept, get some duct tape or masking tape and tape it out on the floor there and have people walk through it pretend like it's actually their space so that you can get a better sense of uh, whether it will work for them. Okay. Um, I'm curious how folks think about the idea of, of assuming staff is moving out versus assuming staff is staying. Because if we're not going to be a able to accommodate all the staff here, that means we need to create some office space for staff somewhere. And the most likely solution to that would be a new building, you know, some kind of a modular or something. Um, that is going to increase the cost dramatically. So I, I'm concerned about that, and I think we I think we should nail down kind of what the assumptions are for this space so that we're really clear with um, whoever comes back with the bid as to what exactly we want to accommodate. So I say minimum three classrooms, kitchenette, room for X staff members. And you know what, maybe I should ask you, Todd, um, we've got Brian and Mario. Other staff you think can be accommodated up front, but I know seasonally we, we have other staff that sit at desks. 
So I always thought we needed about four desks back here. Yeah, at any given time, you need, we need to plan on having four staff. So four staff. Yeah. Yeah. And four cannot fit in Office D, correct? No. I mean, I, I, to answer your question, I, I really saw this as a three-step process if we're highly successful. Step one, this is step one. Staff is in the building and find a way to do that with the architect and design team. And I think to Peter's point, it's, it's well taken. I mean, there's, there's a lot of options as we just start to talk about this that I can see where we can make that happen. Step two is, hey, we're highly successful. The programs are taking off. Come back to council. Here's an option. We recommend we expand our, our center um, and move staff out of the building potentially into a modular or something similar to uh, into the park. And there's a couple of areas that does not encroach on our park. That was going to be a recommendation. There's a cost to that. Um, Step three was that we're highly successful, staff is out of the building, and we're working our way to an even better programs or systems or intergenerational center. And that's, that's how I saw this. I didn't see it over, I don't have any time frames for you. Those were the steps how I saw it. And uh, staff's been working closely with, with us and on those options, and so we have a variety of options. But yes, day one, I don't have a place to put staff if they're not in this area. I mean, we, we do have to figure that out, but we are working towards it. I hope that answers your question. Okay. So is that the assumption that we're going to have moving forward, that there will be room for four staff members with what, whatever configuration we come up with here? Yes. And using the front area as well, yes. Okay. Using the confines of the community center. Yes. Great. Thank yeah. you. Um, I'm really excited about this. I'm excited for all, for the, for the uh, age-friendly group that the task force has put so much time and effort, and especially you, Carla. Um, I hope this, you know, we're able to build something that will make you proud and will, you know, fulfill the needs. Let's, I say we move forward with phase one, as Todd outlined, prove it a success so that then we can move on to state, stage two and three. Um, but I do want to make sure that um, we are at least um, con conscious of the fact that we're going to have to have staff here. So, we've got um, two things we need to do if we're going to move this forward. We need to authorize the town manager to continue with the recommended plan and authorize the town manager to proceed with the supplemental budget appropriation up to 160000 Madam Mayor, members of this, may I just make one change to that now just after I have talking this out? I'd hate to... We are changing the scope of what we discussed a little bit, and I don't know what that bid is actually the appropriate at this point. I'm just, I just want to back away from up to 160,000. How about we put the bid package together as with the design team, as with the input and feedback we have, and we come back to you with that number. I just don't want to throw number, you know. This, this does change it. For instance, the, the assumptions on the ADA alone change it drastically. And so I'm not saying this is going from a $160,000 project to 250. I just don't, I want to be really clear, you know, if there's some savings on what you're talking about and there's some cost. And so it sounds like we're on the right path. We understand what's expected of us. Just do a, don't put a cost to it right now. Let's, we'll come back to you with that, with the bid package. And it'll be early January. I would, okay. okay. But you would like a vote uh, to move forward yes, as please. recommended. Okay. Who wants to make a motion? I'll move that we uh, authorize the town manager to move forward with the recommended plan. Second. Councilmember Andrews. Yes. Councilmember Bailey. Yes. Councilmember Ravazio. Yes. Vice Mayor Condon. Yes. Mayor First. Yes. Congratulations, Age Friendly. It's going to be Thank awesome. Thank you. All right. Now we've got uh, 6V, Sloan's, or 6.5, uh, Sloan's letter. How about it, Sloan? So that r real briefly, this is um, something that um, came about as a part of our participation in marine clean energy. Um, you know, I've observed over the last few years some continuing tensions between the way the public utility, like energy market, just operates in California. And the two basic contestants here, the three, one of them are what are called investor-owned utilities. It is PG&E in Southern California, um, Edison or something like that, and then uh, San Diego Gas and Electric. And then another major player is the California Public Utilities Commission. 
And then the third sort of emerging player are what are called CCA, which are um, community choice aggregators, which is what marine clean energy is. And what has recently happened just within the last week is that the director, the executive director issued what's called a draft resolution, which would essentially, which, which would begin to increase the control of the CPUC, the Public Utilities Commission, over um, the community choice aggregators. Maybe it's a good idea, maybe it's a terrible idea, but for sure it's not happening without any, with virtually any public input of any kind. And the marine clean energies of the world would like an opportunity to participate in that decision making rather than consuming 20 days of it over the course of um, you know, the holiday season and are simply want to delay this and push it back. And they have a couple of other recommended uh, ways in which the issue could be met. But the short of it is they want to try to buy some more time and they are also apprehensive about things like they understand, you know, the, the way that the Public Utilities Commission operates is noticeably distinct from almost any other public entity I'm aware of and certainly the court system, which is that you can have these what they call ex parte communications, which they mean different from litigation, as you may be familiar with, um, because you could, in other words, the, the, they would like the, the, the CCAs of the world would like sunlight brought into what the investor-owned utilities and others are telling the Public Utilities Commission, and they would like that to be considered as part of the process. And so in an effort to support this, they want those entities which have a separate governing body, like Marine Clean Energy is governed by our town and all the other member entities which are elected officials, um, to weigh in and let the Public Utilities Commission know that there's some oversight being given to the CCAs and it seems to be working out all right and why don't we be a little more deliberate in the process. So that's the two cent version. I'm sorry, maybe longer than I meant to, Diane, but that's, and so um, they farmed out and I think all the CCAs have farmed out to all their member electeds, um, draft letters about what they would like it to say. I took the one they gave, which was like three and a half pages, single spaced and just not my style, as you guys know. I can't, I can't pay attention to something for more than about 20 minutes, so I, um, I boiled it down to my own views. Um, and I'm asking your permission to send it on Corte Madeira Town letterhead. Uh, I'll do it under my own name so that um, they can contact me if they have questions. But, um, and I, I may have, I don't know how our authority works about whether we can do these things, but I didn't feel comfortable and Diane has a right of it about, we should, I sh you guys should tell me whether you're comfortable with the concept here or not. And if so, can I send it out on firm letterhead, uh, town letterhead? Okay, any questions? Any public comment? See none, I'll bring it back. I'm fine with this, you should add your title. Okay. Um, Go but, for it. And put it on letterhead and I presume. Thank you, Diane, Jack thank you, Bob, Carla. Yeah. Absolutely. Jim, are you All good right. with it? Yeah, my only comment would be first paragraph where you have community choice aggregation. Yes. Put in CCA in quotes. Yeah. If you're going to use the acronym later on, even though I assume they know more about acronyms than we ever will. Uh, has anybody thought of doing a Freedom of Information Act? request against public utility no, commission. No, it's an excellent idea. I don't know if those even, uh, yes, that's an excellent idea. I don't know. Yeah, just say we want everything related to that. And ju just so that they know that we're thinking about them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a glacial process, Jim. I become very frustrated when we have our meetings because I believe there are, frankly, constitutional issues in the way that this, what was originally known as a grand bargain between publicly owned utilities and the, the public about how these things work, but just as in my own capacity, I think the four of you would have the identical view if you sat in my chair is there should be no secret anything ever, and there should be plenty of time for the public to say anything they'd like about everything. Mm -hmm. um, so those precepts, I just don't feel controversial to me, and it's surprising that I'm writing a letter saying these two things ought to be what you ought to be considering, because it just seems brutally, brutally obvious to me. There are a lot of things in government that seem obvious that, for whatever reason, just aren't so. so Good letter. Okay, thank, like thank you very much. Okay, I think everybody approves. Let's take mm -hmm. a quick vote. Somebody want to make a motion? I'll move to so, approve that we uh, it's authorize Sloan to, to write the letter. Okay. With, with yeah. any required minor edits? With any required minor edits on town letterhead. And I'll second that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you all.
Councilmember Andrews? Yes. Councilmember Bailey? Yes. Councilmember Ovazio? Yes. Vice Mayor Condon? Yes. Mayor First? Yes. All right. Moving on. Town Manager and Council Reports, Agenda Item 7. Town Manager. Just two really quick ones. So first, um, as you know, we uh, have, for the last 30 days, we've been putting on the Corte Madera Cares fundraiser for the fire victims uh, north of us. And um, we didn't raise this as much as I had hoped, but, uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, competing interests, you know, with the Tory Drive, and everybody's trying to do their own thing, but we did raise approximately $10,000 for that fundraiser, so I'm, I'm really happy to report that. And the second one is, I, I have individually talked to each one of you about this, but I wanted to publicly uh, discuss it uh, quickly in an update. Um, Alta Terrace is, uh, is, a, is above uh, um, Alta Way. Um, it is not a publicly maintained road. It has not been dedicated to the town. However, those residents are residents of the town of Corte Madera and paid taxes. Um, they approached the town. It's been a kind of an ongoing issue for their neighborhood. Um, there's approximately 30 residents um, that have been communicating with the town over the past couple years over the state of the road and the frustration that it's not publicly maintained. The issue at hand is over the past uh, five years, uh, three utility companies, including the Sanitary District, have done work on repairs for their roadway that was, I will describe, in very poor condition as it is. And normally when we do uh, utility work on the road, we will patch it. And the patches have just made the road, have really deteriorated it. The last utility companies, PG&E, with their, their work that they've been doing, um, and it really came to a head. And so uh, I met with the every resident on the block. We had a, a large discussion and, and it's really two issues. One is, is it uh, maintained by the town? And that's really an issue that we'll continue to work with with, with the neighbors and the town attorney uh, moving forward. But at, at the issue was with PG&E. They were mobilized to do work and repair the roadway. And so the, the community, the residents up there asked that we, the town, uh, negotiate on their behalf to see what we can do to help them with the roadway. And so after a number of discussions, uh, we came to an agreement where PG&E offered to share the cost. And a Marin Municipal Water District will also uh, be involved moving forward, which will lower our cost. Our cost is approximately $32,000. Um, and so PG&E offered, they're already mobilized, to actually repave the roadway. So to actually grind it down two inches and rebuild their roadway, which will last 30 plus years, and they'll have a brand new roadway. Um, it moved really fast, so staff negotiated with PG&E. Um, I approved the tentative agreement to enter with PG&E uh, to offer $32,000 from the sanitary district for the work that we had done um, as a portion. Marin Municipal Water District will follow, but we're still negotiating with them. Uh, again, time is of the essence because they're mobilized. Um, PG&E is going to do the work, and so the town attorney uh, has helped me craft a. Um, an agreement with PG&E, and so that is moving forward, unless I hear otherwise from the, the town council. Um, I felt it was the right thing to do due to the circumstances, um, and so uh, we're going to move forward over the next two weeks with that project, and, um, you know, I, I'm excited for, it's a good Christmas present for Alta Terrace, the residents up there, so they're very happy. The second thing is we'll continue. It's similar to the, the conversations we've had up on Summit uh, years back on is it a publicly maintained road, was it dedicated to the town, and we're kind of going through that process again with a number of streets up in the Chapman Park area, so that will come back to council at some point, but I did want to share with you, um, and I hope you agree with my decision making on that, I just felt like it was the right thing to do uh, under the circumstances, and so it's a $32,000 expenditure from the sanitary district for prior work that we did, we patched it um, when I think now we have the opportunity to actually repair and give them a new roadway with the other utilities. So and I'm happy to answer any questions. I just, I have a question. Todd, is that money that we'll be spending for that? Um, is that taking away from any other projects? No, that'll come, that'll be a supplemental appropriation from the, uh, the Sanitary District General Fund. Right. And we are fully funded. It will not take monies away from any other project. Oh, good. Yes. Thank you. So basically what we're putting into it is, well, first, we aren't accepting responsibility for the road in, on a go-forward basis. We're helping to chip in to resurface the road since the sanitation district was one of three entities that uh, helped tear up the road, okay? 
and we're also providing sort of engineering slash supervision capability to the project. Is that true? That's correct on all fronts, and it's a pro it is not the town, it is the sanitary district. Yes, right. exactly, right. and that is really important moving okay. forward as we go. Yes, we are not accepting responsibility for yeah. that roadway. Right, yes. Okay, all right. Uh, Just have one question on that. Um, is there a, did, do the property owners on that road, do they have any kind of shared agreement to maintain the road that's recorded on their titles? So we, we started that. Um, yeah, so there are some things uh, with certain residences and shared easements and, and such. They have an attorney that is going through this process right now. We're, we're in the beginning stages of vetting that. Okay. Um, but the under, a, a couple of the residents have shared with me verbally that, yes, when they bought that property, it was explained to them that it's not a publicly owned street. It is shared amongst easements amongst the other residents. Right. I mean, I want to help people out, but just if you're talking about going to other streets, that should be part of the process because oftentimes it's recorded on title that you know there's a shared then there's a shared agreement between everybody when that road was developed right. that says they're going to maintain the property and it's their responsibility to do so. There is some conflicting. And I'm fine, as I said, I'm yeah. fine with helping people out, but let's go in with open eyes and know what we're going into. Here. It's a good point. So I do want to. So there is conflicting information on that a little bit, and so we're working through that. We are not setting precedent here. This and, 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 the, and the only way that this was even possible under at, at this point was that the sanitary district did work on that roadway. And there's always this conversation. This roadway is very narrow in scope, and so there's always this conversation of, hey, if we touch a roadway. Do you bring it back to the present condition? Or in some instances, you're like, hey, let's just fix it, you know, when it's cost effective and there's that conversation, that balance. Um, so here, it was the right thing to do with the other utility companies. But moving forward, there is, a, there is kind of this interesting discussion of some of these streets, you know. Well, I mean, it, if it, the th I think what you're saying, Bob, which, which would make perfect sense to me, maybe it's not realistic to get it done on such short in time, Todd, but it'd be... It would make sense to me to tell the people who share the road, this problem will now be solved for you this time, but we should have a mutual understanding that you now bear a share of responsibility for this private road, which out of an effort to help our people, we're going to get done for you and organize the correct funding to do it, but that this is not, this does not somehow change your continuing responsibility to be, to pay for this in the future. So verbally, that has been the conversation, and then in writing, um, we've discussed should we have an agreement with each, with each citizen, or each resident on the roadway. I'm I'm leaning more towards with the town attorney's help of, of basically summarizing that in, a, in an official letter and, and giving it to each. Well, it's got to be with the deeds. In other words, it should ride with the land, so that whoever buys the house is subject to the same responsibility. I think it's more up to them of like, we're not accepting responsibility. This is what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're doing it. We're not setting. Right. You know, we're not, and, and I think right. there's still some more work to be vetted legally on this specific situation. So I'm not, you know, I'm, what I've seen so far, and I think the town attorney can speak for that, it, this is not a publicly maintained road. It has not been dedicated to the town, but there's still some work to be done. But thank you. All right, council member reports. Start down here, Bob. Uh, attended the Rouse Valley Paramedic Association meeting. Um, did a lot of things, but the main thing is the paramedic tax renewal is going to be on the ballot in 2018. So I'm not sure if ours is on the same calendar or not, but in the RVPA it's going to be. So uh, June 2019. Yeah, June or November. I think November. Okay. I said I think it's November. Uh, I'll, I'll find out next meeting. Uh, right after that meeting, which was on the same night, I got to attend the town fire safety meeting, which was held jointly with Larkspur, which was just a great event. Uh, we had over 200 people attend, it looked like, um, by count. Um, but I thought one of the most, the, the big takeaway for me was how important it is to create continuing opportunities for our police and fire to interact with the public. That was, I think, one of the best things to come out of it. People realize that these are real people, not just people in uniforms. And also, they're great. <laughs> they're smart. <laughs> they know what they're doing. They're articulate. And the interaction uh, and everything was just fantastic. Uh, besides getting a lot of great fire safety information out there. Do you mind if I interject a quick fact? That was video recorded. Thank you, Rebecca, for arranging that. 
So it is on the town YouTube channel for all to see. Uh, finally, just the uh, Twin Cities Coalition for Healthy Youth. Uh, we had uh, a seminar of parent education, which was held at Drake High School, uh, called Marijuana is Legal Now What?, including a panel discussion, which was kind of the main format of it, including Matt Willis, who's the uh, County Health and Human Services Director. And we had a counselor. We had uh, actually a student who was in recovery. Great event. We had about 80 parents. We're going to be duplicating it in uh, the spring at Redwood, uh, hopefully to a larger audience. So stay tuned for that. But we'll be talking about lots more stuff. We have lots more coming up in the first half of 2018. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Well, uh, I attended the Marin Telecommunications Agency. Uh, Barbara Thornton and Suki Sennert, who basically run it for years, and in fact, I think helped set it up. Uh, announced that they <coughs> wanted to retire, so we're going to have to find uh, replacements for them. Ooh. Also, uh, those of us who thought the issue of uh, cell phone towers uh, went away when Sacramento, the bill died in Sacramento, it turns out the Senate, or to be more exact, <coughs> Senator Thune of uh, South Dakota uh, Commerce Committee, uh, is working on federal legislation to force local governments to lease out publicly owned infrastructure, eliminate unreasonable local environmental and design review, uh, and eliminate the ability of local governments to negotiate leases at fair prices or public benefits for the installation of, quote, small, uh, close quote, wireless equipment on taxpayer, taxpayer funded property. And it's basically the Sacramento legislation uh, on federal steroids. So I don't, from a constitutional standpoint, I don't understand how they can force us to do that, but they're the feds, so what the hell. <laughs> anyway. Thank you. Sloan? Uh, no reports, although happy holidays and happy new year to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Carla? Um, just a couple of things. Um, I've been busy working on this plan and um, it was really coincidence that the rep that um, uh, where I was going for uh, some of the furnishings it happens that she's a Redwood mom of two kids and she was so excited about the intergenerational center that she wrote a letter to the principal and to a counselor there saying how they have to get involved and get the kids involved and um, we've had just a tremendous amount of support from the oddest places where we just don't even expect it and people that are so so supportive of this and Diane I will say that I do not disagree with you one bit about that to reduce the the width of the um, the reception area and make the other room bigger or make um, C just a tiny bit bigger and make B I mean C smaller and B bigger yeah that's that's yeah and anyway it it's what's good about it though too is that everything is is so flexible um, the way it is but anyway we've spent a tremendous amount of time on that and um, just that I already have in my mind's eye the, the whole thing completed. Um, we even have uh, people that have volunteered to uh, lead programs. And uh, so we're, we're really filling, filling the place up right away. Um, the other thing that I'll just mention is that I was reappointed to the League of California Cities, uh, the state policy. Committee for Housing and Economic Good. Development. Good for you. Good. Great. So, and that's, that's it. Thank you. Um, the third lane on the Richmond Bridge is due to be open by the end of January. Wow. Wow. I know. Yeah. Time flies the, when you're having fun. Uh, on the Marin side, Transportation Authority of Marin has been working on. Um, some improvements to the East Sir Francis Drake Boulevard route to the bridge. So you'll probably see a lot of construction kind of by um, the melting pot. Oh yeah. They're extending two lanes and have the, the merge down to one lane further down so it's not so close to that stoplight to hopefully get, get things flowing. But at some a little point better. it still goes down. It still goes down to one lane. Look, it's 
tough geography over there and limited budget. Um, there are some uh, improvements in the work for the Bellum off-ramp at some point also. Uh, but end of January, that should be open. Uh, for those of you who are interested in Highway 37 and the future of Highway 37, which we all know is very close to sea level and we had some terrible flooding last year, there is a survey online. There is a link from the Transportation Authority of Marin homepage. Um, so give them your feedback on what you'd like to see out there. There are different concepts. It's going to be horrendously expensive no matter what they do unless they abandon it. Um, but all of the improvements, their concepts they're coming up with are very expensive. Um, let's see. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. So let's move on. It's 9.20. It's been a long meeting. Agenda item 8.1, review of draft agenda for January 16th town council meeting. Any changes, additions? Anything? Either for this agenda or the following one, we could start Thanks. the discussion of what to do with the sales tax override. Sounds good. Yep. Good. Bring it in January. Thank you. Yeah. Any member of the public want to speak on this? See none. Uh, no other additions, changes? Well, this brings us to nine reorganization of the town council. We discussed this earlier. Anybody want to make a motion to uh, appoint mayor? So moved. Carla. Carla. Half Carla. Carla. Of course. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Who wants much. a second? I'll second it. Thank you. Councilmember Anders? Yes. Councilmember Bailey? Yes. Councilmember Ravazio? Yes. Vice Mayor Condon? Yes. Mayor First? Yes. Okay. Um, I'd like to that nominate. we. Uh, Oh, congratulations, yes, Mayor. Diane is Vice Mayor. Right, is that what you're going to say, Bob? Yeah. Sure. Oh, I can second you, you it. You said well. it. Go ahead. All right. I'll second it. Yes. yes. Councilmember Andrews. Yes. Councilmember Bailey. Yes. Councilmember Ravazio. Yes. Um, Vice Mayor first. <laughs> I don't. I don't remember how to do this. Yes. Yeah. Just... Mayor Condon. Yes. Okay. Is that acceptable? And I'd like to say, Diane. So gracious, number one. And number two, you did such an amazing job, and we had so many challenging things. Thank you. Not fun at all, and you just did a beautiful job. Thank you. And thank Appreciate you. That. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. If, if you'd like, you could adjourn the meeting. Well, you have the gavel, it is yours. <laughs> if any, if there are no objections, then. Meeting is adjourned. Happy holidays, Thank everybody. You. Happy Thank holidays. You.